right, we're going to call the Planning Commission meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Edward Keller. Accident excused. Why are you silent? Here. Christine Holcomb. Here. Carol Bain. Here. Mark Borshore. Here. Tom Cozell. Here. Robert Newsley. Yes, and excused. Keith Fell. Here. And Kathy A. Schweiker. Here. Thank you. Item number four, amendments to agenda. Hearing none, I will move on to item number five, which is approval of minutes. Madam Chair, I make a motion to approve the minutes of September 25th, 2019 Planning Commission meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Minutes are approved. Item number six is, says new business, public hearing for 73. Madam Chair. I, at this point in time, would like to be recused from this portion of the hearing due to uh, my personal feelings of impartiality. Okay, thank you. Um, the Planning Commission needs to vote on this, so we only need a motion. Support. I will so move. Second. We have a motion to support. Everybody understand? Yeah. All right. Um, do a roll call. I'll vote to that. Edward Keller excused. Whitey Simon here. Christine Holcomb here. Harold Bay here. Mark Borshart here. Tom Cozell here. Robert Musling. Three. No, no, no. We'll call for yeah. for the motion. motion. Oh, for the motion. Sorry. Confusion. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> motion to recuse. Motion is to have our music recuse from no, 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 no. Keith. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. That's oh, okay. no, boy, you got me totally okay. I'll slow down. I apologize. Motion is to recuse uh, for item 6A. 6A. Public hearing. Public hearing. Keith Bell? Yes. Edward Keller? Brady Simon? Yes. Christine Holcomb? Yes. Carol Bain? Yep. Mark Borchardt? Yep. Yeah. Tom Cozell? Yes. Robert Musing? And Kathy Schweiger? Yes. <coughs> Motion passes. Yep. We'll get you when we get passes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go back to once. Item 6A, public hearing in regards to 71 or 7317 Dyke Road. I am going to continue with the public hearing at 710. And at this particular point, I am going to ask our planners for any presentation they would like to do in regard to this project. Right, Actually, you, can I stop you sure, for one yeah, second? Absolutely. Just so we can lay the ground rules. Would you read sure. the rules? Public hearing, public comment rules, number one, all comments must be made through the chairperson. Comments directed to the applicant from the office <coughs> are prohibited. Number two, individuals wishing to speak have time limits. Three minutes for each member of the general public and six minutes for a spokesperson of a larger group. 
such as a subdivision, association, condo association, business group, and similar groups. Three, anyone wishing to speak is asked to sign the sign-in sheet provided. However, anyone wishing to speak will be given the opportunity. Four, each individual will be allowed to speak once. It will be the chairperson's decision as to whether rebuttal comments will be allowed. Five, citizens may appoint a spokesperson to represent those who agree on a point of view. And six, public comments on a specific public hearing request should be made during the public hearing for that item. Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right from here? Uh, instead of standing in front of the screen and blocking it, I'm going to try to do my report from here and hopefully it'll make it a little easier. <clears throat> I literally worked right before we started. We just tested it. Okay, okay, good, good. All right. Okay, we're going to start off just by going through some uh, aerial photographs to get everybody oriented. I know most people are familiar with this site, but this is a, a general aer aerial showing um, the location. <coughs> Um, this is a closer up version. This is a, a 2019 um, aerial photograph. This is a 2017. One of the things we've talked about is how the, the, the water levels have had an impact um, on the size of, the, of what is known as the Penske Island. And you'll see that as we take a look at some of the aerial photographs here. This is from 2014. You can tell this is obviously during the um, boating season. And you get a feel for the uh, boats out in uh, Bouvier Bay. Um, here's another one from 2011. You can see the size of the island is, is quite bigger uh, in, those particular, in this particular area. And just to familiar, familiarize everyone with the zoning, um, this is zone C3 general business. Properties to the north and south are R1. Um, and then there's C3, which is also residential, um, excuse me, C3 directly east across um, the creek uh, canal from, uh, from the subject site. And then on the other side of Dyke Road um, is R4 uh, residential. Uh, access to this site is proposed from one point of access. It's an existing access to the island that's going to be improved uh, and widened. And this is a drawing from their most recent site plan showing um, how that's going to be improved um, to approximately, I believe it's 30 feet wide was the dimension that uh, the improvements are going to be made uh, for improvements. And uh, if we go back here, we can see that it looks, it effectively is, is a shared drive um, um, from, from appearances and driving by the site with, uh, with the Rose Marine property. Um, this will define it and make an improvement um, to the approach um, through the permits that are going to be ultimately, if approved, issued through MDOT, since this is a state road. Uh, this is just a photograph of what it looks like today, what the access is like. Obviously, this is not a commercial uh, level access. This is a older access that's been there for, for many, many years. So the proposal you have is uh, a, application for both special land use and site plan approval. It includes a restaurant with a capacity of 134 people. It includes a transient marina with approximately 133 boats. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, a future bathhouse, outdoor dining, live entertainment, a pool area. Uh, we have a range there. It, most of the calculations show 223 people, but there's still a floor plan that shows 456 people, so that's obviously a point of discussion. Um, uh, event area number one um, has a capacity of 424. I believe there's also a document that talks about 450, but we believe 424 is the number that is actually being proposed. And then these are the dimensional requirements from the ordinance, uh, setback standards, and um, the, the top is for the restaurant, then for event area number one, and then for the um, future bathhouse. It appears that the setback requirements are going to be met. 
And although we don't have necessarily all the details on the height of, uh, of a tent or the future bathhouse, um, we would expect that those could also and would likely be able to conform with the uh, maximum height. So here's the, here's the latest um, plan that was submitted. Uh, one of the things that happened with this most recent submittal is we received three new sheets, um, full-size sheets, uh, but there was not a complete resubmittal of all the information. So that's, that's a point of information I think we need to talk about in terms of do you have what you consider to be a complete package of everything that's been submitted and is current up to date? Uh, we were hoping that the applicant would have provided a complete full set of information this time around, but we don't have that. So if you're not comfortable with that, we need to have a discussion with the applicant. Make sure everybody is on the same page in terms of exactly what's being proposed. There was an eight and a half by 11 version that we did receive. Um, of a full set, however, a lot of that was not necessarily legible because of the, um, the, the resolution of the images and, and, the, and the text. So um, that, that's a point of information, but I'm not going to dwell on that right now. I want to get through the information. This is a, kind of a blow up of the of southeast end showing the approach uh, coming in uh, to, the, to the site, a single approach. Uh, this is a uh, enlargement of the restaurant and pool area. There's a pool area, outdoor patio, um, and you can see some of the improvements there are being made along the shoreline where boats would have the ability uh, to come up along the south shoreline here. And they'll also be able to do that along the east shoreline. We'll get to that in a minute. So this is the floor plan um, showing the layout of the restaurant, showing the outdoor area, um, showing the pool area, showing, showing some outdoor tables and the like. Um, this was provided um, with the most recent submittal of the applicant in terms of their um, application from the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, what they are proposing to do is, and it will depend upon, obviously, uh, the, the size of boats that come in, but uh, the estimate that has been provided is approximately 133 boats uh, would be berthed along the, the east and the south side and that um, they are proposing to raft, as you can see, uh, boats in four across on the south side and two to three across on the east side. Um, if, for those of you who are familiar with St. Clair County and its Blue Ways plan, there are kayak trails that go through this area, uh, one of which um, runs along the bay, um, subject sites up here, and then there's also one, the, the Bovian Creek actually runs right up the east side of the property and heads out here. So these are um, existing established kayak routes uh, from St. Clair County Blue Ways. And then this is just a, a little bit of an enlargement of the Bovian Creek. Uh, goes under the bridge and, go, as I mentioned, goes along um, the east side of the subject property. So parking requirements. This is a, a summary of the parking requirements. So for a restaurant, the standard is based on one per two occupants. So there's a maximum of 134. Uh, so that gives you 67 required spaces. There's 100 cars, uh, 100 car, 106 parking spaces provided on the site plan that was included. The pool area is uh, based on one parking space per three occupants. That with 223, assuming that's the correct number and not the number shown on the floor plan, then you end up with 75 spaces. And then the event area, which is the tent area, one per three persons, um, 223 occupants there as well, um, 75 spaces. And the applicant has indicated that these would not be operating at the same time, the, the pool area and the event area. If there's a full event, that is occurring where 223 people would be coming, the pool area would not be operational. And so that's how they're proposing that their parking um, be calculated. Um, however, they're also asking for a waiver for a portion of those spaces, as we've discussed before. Your ordinance allows the Planning Commission to potentially waive up to 25% of the required parking um, due to the availability of boat docking. So someone could come to a, a, a piece of property or a land use 
and visit by boat. And if the applicant can demonstrate to you that you, you believe that up to 25% of the patrons would come by boat, you can reduce the required number of parking spaces. So in this case, they could get 35 spaces um, total, um, potentially of the, um, of the total uh, that was required, uh, which, is, which is 142. And um, they end up actually with a deficit of one because there's a rounding up that, that had, to, had to take place. And so they're short one space. So I'm sure that's something that could be resolved if this was accepted by them modifying the plan or making an adjustment in the number of people. Uh, but assuming you accept that, uh, that waiver, then potentially they would, with some minor adjustments, be able to provide for the amount of parking um, under this particular formula. There's also requirements for a parking lot green space, and these are highlighted on this plan. Uh, there's a 10% um, landscape island. The, uh, one of the items we mentioned in our, in our report is to confirm the landscape island dimensions um, because some don't appear to meet the 10 foot minimum width. Uh, that's a detail that can be, I think, it's figured out um, at some point in the future with some minor adjustments. Um, and then they've asked for an extension of paving of the parking lot. Uh, your ordinance uh, requires that it be done immediately or within six months, uh, and they are asking to extend that out beyond that time frame. That's something you can't grant permission for because that's a change from the ordinance. So they would have to actually ask the Zoning Board of Appeals for, for that type of a variance to, to extend that. So um, just so you know, that's something that that can't be granted by the Planning Commission because you can't waiver an ordinance provision. The applicant has always also indicated that they have two parking seasons. The off season is from November 1st to May 1st, where they said that only a restaurant would be in operation. So 67 spaces would be required, 106 provided, which would be in compliance. And then the on season, so to speak, uh, which is from May to November, and that's where they have the one space and the, the waiver that's been mentioned. Now the other factor that we've discussed briefly previously is whether or not the marina itself, which is the boats coming in and, and, and berthing and being able to have access to the island, if that would in fact require parking. Because your ordinance has a parking requirement. And it's um, one for every two boat berths. Okay? One space for every two boat berths. So that's a decision that you're going to have to make in terms of whether or not you think that applies. Um, they are also asking that those um, boat areas be available for overnight. Um, and that's where a concern has been raised about the potential to generate a parking demand when a boat can stay overnight. Because theoretically, you could be there or a friend could be there and that you could want to spend the night and park your car there. So do you do you feel comfortable that the marina is not going to actually generate parking spaces? So that's a discussion that you should have with the applicant and you should get feedback and determine if you're comfortable with the fact that the marina, as it is going to be operated, is not going to actually generate any parking. Because that's what they're proposing to you, that it will not generate any parking demand. Um, it will only be the actual uses the restaurant, the event areas, um, so and the like that are going to generate the, the demand for, for parking uh, on the site. Uh, traffic, they did submit a traffic impact assessment and it has been reviewed. Uh, so here's a summary uh, based on the counts that were taken August 16th through 20th. Um, Saturday had the highest volume on Dyke Road with 15,347 vehicles per day. The highest hourly count was on Friday. Uh, on Friday, it was 1,200 vehicles from 5 to 6 p.m. And the highest hourly count on Saturday was 1,139 vehicles from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. The traffic study suggests that no more than 65% of the vehicles will arrive and leave during the peak hour, which would mean a maximum of 68 hourly trips based on the 106 parking spaces that are provided there. And the study assumes that 50% of the traffic would be entering and 50% would be exiting during that highest peak hour of the day. 
The proposed development according to the study and the plans is planned for a build out of summer of 2022 once all the improvements are in place. Um, our traffic group believes that when you have a build out that extends beyond one year, you typically account for background growth in traffic. That's traffic that's growing from other developments in the area. Uh, we've provided some background historic counts and <laughs> typically uh, we've seen a range of one half a percent to two percent annual growth rate um, that's applied to adjust background or existing traffic to a future point in time. Uh, so that's something that uh, we have not seen in the current uh, traffic impact assessment. Also, there are warrants that MDOT uses to determine whether or not a left turn lane or a right turn taper or lane is, 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 is required for, a pro for property. Um, and the chart provided by MDOT, which is actually in their study, is based on the total development and the existing traffic volumes. But it doesn't factor in the background growth rate and it doesn't factor in the traffic from this development on top of the existing project when you look at the total 24 hour volume. So if you were to amend that, we believe that it will have an impact on where um, the, the chart falls. It's very close to warranting a left turn lane accommodation, which would be either a passing lane or a center left turn lane. So uh, we'd like to see some more information. Also, the applicants indicated that if the parking lot is full, they're essentially going to close the driveway and not allow anybody else in. Um, so one of the questions we have in that scenario is if, it, if there's an event there, let's say it's a large wedding and that's the event in the evening, I know they're, assume, they're, they're asking for you to assume that 25% would be coming um, by boat. Well, if it's bad weather um, and people decide to drive, what happens if those people drive and they want to come there and there's no parking? Um, are, they're just going to turn them away at the driveway. Um, How is that going to work? You're going to, it's, not, it's not like you're going out to eat. And you're just going to go somewhere else and eat. You're going to a wedding event. So I think there needs to be some discussion about um, how that's going to work. And also, would that have an impact on some of the assumptions that uh, are related to the inbound lefts and the inbound rights? Could that possibly increase uh, those numbers? Um, the Rose Marine, we talked about the, um, the access, um, our, our traffic um, um, team felt that um, depending on what happens there, they, they really are functioning kind of like a shared driveway now. Uh, and what happens when boats and boat trailers are turning out of um, that particular business and what impact does that have on the left turns in, left turns out? and the, the ability to stack and queue, and if a left turn lane was provided, how might that be impacted? So that's just a question we have um, that could be resolved with some supplemental information. Um, also, um, the assumption that boat traffic is not correct, I talked about that a little bit, I kind of combined two um, together. Uh, and so if the wedding guests are arriving on a scheduled event, 90% arrive by vehicle rather than the 75%, it's assumed in the study, and I think our, our original letter had a typo, it said 25%, but the 75%, uh, is it reasonable to expect that they're just gonna leave the venue and go somewhere else? And then the boat traffic, as you know, one of the things we asked for was a narrative and findings related to projected weekday and weekend boat traffic and how boat traffic will impact existing navigation and other nearby users of the waterway. Um, we did not see that narrative. Um, they did provide a series of emails with the Army Corps of Engineers, and I know that they have received a permit um, from the Army Corps of Engineers, but um, we have not received the narrative that addresses how the boat traffic from this project is going to impact um, navigation and how, it would, how much boat traffic would actually be generated during the peak hour um, on the weekend and, and weekday uh, peak hours. So because uh, the event area and the outdoor activity areas are in fact special approval uses, there are standards in your ordinance that you need to be aware of and you should be reviewing as part of that. And I'm gonna list them here, I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but I think you, you've got them, you've reviewed them, but um, there are several of them. Will it, I, I'm just gonna hit the highlights. Will it be in accordance with the general objectives, intent, and purposes of the zoning ordinance? 
Will it be in accordance with the goals and objectives of the master plan? Uh, will it be designed, constructed, and operated and maintained in harmony with the existing or intended character of the general vicinity um, and not change the essential character of the area, area in which it is proposed? Will it not be um, hazardous or disturbing to existing or future uses of the same by general vicinity and the community as a whole? Um, will it be served adequately by essential public facilities and services such as highway streets, police fire, stormwater drainage, refuge, uh, disposal, waterway, um, and the like? Um, will it uh, will not create uh, an excessive additional requirements at a public cost for facilities or services and not be detrimental to economic welfare of the community will not involve uses activities processes materials or equipment or conditions or an operation that will be detrimental to any person property or general welfare by reason of excessive production of traffic noise vibration etc will ensure that the development will be preserved in its natural state in as far as practicable and minimizing tree and soil removal and by topographic modifications which result in maximum harmony with adjacent areas and will not impede the normal and orderly development and improvement of surrounding property for uses permitted in the zoning district. Um, also, you have site plan standards in your ordinance as well. So when you review a site plan, you should consider those. These are the, uh, under A, we have vehicular access um, and circulation. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but you have that available in your ordinance. Um, there's a separate circulation um, component as part of your site plan standards that deals with impacts, um, stacking lanes, parking lanes, um, and impacts on adjacent properties. And then you have other site plan review standards that deal with the relationship to the surrounding property. Um, in, in making the determination, Planning Commission shall review the plan for negative conditions, such as, but not limited to, location of the principal building and accessory buildings, Channel, channeling um, excessive traffic onto local residential streets, lack of adequate site screening, particular interest to parking, maneuvering, and service areas, impediments to the access of emergency vehicles, site drainage characteristics, and accumulation and storage of litter, snow, production of noise, light, smoke, fumes, or dust. And then relationship to natural features, that's another component that you're supposed to review as part of the site plan, infrastructure, landscaping. So um, to summarize, you have a number of options before you. Obviously, I think one of the first ones is going to be discussing outstanding questions and determining if you have all the information that you need in order to make a decision. That's obviously very important. Uh, when it comes, and you're, and you're continuing your public hearing tonight, okay? So that's another key element is listening to the public, getting input from them. Uh, in terms of um, some outstanding items that we've identified that we think you should discuss, you know, confirmation of proposed um, occupancies, how many people in all those areas, making sure since there's some confusion in the plans, we want to make sure those numbers, everybody understands them and everybody agrees that that's actually what's being proposed. <laughs> The hours of operation and the maximum permitted stay for the transient marina. And a big question for the Planning Commission is does that overnight parking trigger any additional parking requirements or does the daytime parking trigger any additional uh, parking requirements because of the marina operation? The hours of operation for the outdoor dining and the live entertainment. Obviously, as we saw from the zoning map and we saw from the aerial photo photography, there are residential properties nearby. So um, are you comfortable with the hours of operation that are being proposed for uh, outdoor activities and the impact that that's going to have on residential areas. If not, would you, if you were to approve this, would you modify that? And so that would be something you would want to discuss. Parking waivers and the impact of the special land uses. So do you, are you comfortable with the requested 25% uh, parking waiver? Seasonal variations in respect to the required parking. Um, does that seem acceptable in terms of what has been proposed? Um, parking lot paving timeline and, and a bond that would ensure that that happens. As I mentioned, you can't grant an extension of the time to construct the parking lot. Um, that would have to be done through the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and I mean, and when I say construct, I mean paving. They're going to construct it but not finish it. That's their proposal. And then special land use approval standards, site plan approval <coughs> standards, those, those I think you're just summarize those and you're aware of those. The, uh, the traffic impact assessment comments, um, 
boat traffic and safety, um, Army Corps of Engineers input. Is there additional uh, information needed? As you're aware, late this afternoon, we did get some information from the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I haven't had a chance to really go through it. Um, that's, that's information that kind of came in at the last minute. So that's something you may want to, to review at all, uh, additional, in addition to the information you already have. And then the input from the township engineer, any concerns or comments related to stormwater runoff and other engineering related input. Do you have everything you feel comfortable that you need or would you um, request anything uh, beyond what you've already received? So in terms of action, there's some options that I think um, you have before you. Obviously the applicant's requesting that you approve the special land use and the site plan as presented with no conditions except obviously the paving of the parking that would have to be uh, addressed by the ZBA. So that's, that's, that's what the applicant is asking of you. Um, Another, there are obviously a wide variety of, of variations that could happen depending upon what your findings are after you've gone through your deliberations. One might be, for example, to approve the special land use and site plan as presented, but limit the capacity of the tented event area to some specified lesser amount and reevaluate the capacity, allow them to come back in and ask for expansion at a later date kind of stepping into it to see if, if it's working and if the assumptions are actually um, going according to what they proposed and allowing for a reevaluation. So that's another option. Approving the restaurant only and not approving the special land uses. Um, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is the restaurant is a principal permitted use. So if they can show they meet all the ordinance requirements, you need to approve the restaurant because that is a principal permitted use. That's not a discretionary decision. You can't say, oh, I'd rather there not be a restaurant there. Um, you've identified that as a principal permitted use. If it meets all the ordinance requirements, the restaurant itself has to be permitted. Um, approve the, the restaurant in the pool patio area over only and allow for the marina with no overnight use. So that could be another option where you're allowing the restaurant, you're allowing for the pool patio area, People can use the, the docking spaces, but you can't have any overnight um, guests there and there would be no tented events there. It's kind of another variation. Um, approve the restaurant in the tented event area only, so and not approve the pool entertainment area. Approve all special land uses and principal uses, limit the hours of operation um, of the outdoor activities, but an in time. Uh, approve all special land uses and principal uses and, and limit or prohibit the overnight stay by boats or vehicles and vehicles. And then other conditions or limitations that we haven't even talked about. Um, obviously, you always have the option to um, postpone this if you feel like you still don't have all the information that you need. Um, and then you also have the option to deny the applicant's request um, if you feel that it does not meet the standards in the ordinance. So those are just a few of the possibilities that I mentioned. There are many more, but I thought it might be helpful to put some of those out just so you can think about um, which option you think fits best in terms of your independent review of the application that is coming for you. So um, I think I covered all of those um, leftover items. So I will conclude with leaving the site plan um, slide up so we can have that for reference and we'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Bob. At this point, I would move on to the applicants if they would like to address um, for the public hearing. You're more than welcome. Please yes. come forward and state your name and address, please. Okay. <clears throat> Joe Henninger, Blue Horseshoe. Brian Pro, Blue Horseshoe. Um, we got Rod's paper uh, late Friday email to us, which covered a lot of what he had. And, you know, we tried to answer, um, you know, a lot of specifics that we thought that might not be totally correct in our uh, paper that we got from him. So we prepared a uh, PowerPoint presentation to go over those points. There's some, we feel some points that were missed, and uh, we can cover that with this presentation. Maybe it's one of the lines. 
Okay, this is the, uh, the fourth review. Um, you know, we started this back uh, with our first check written to Giffels back in 2017. Um, so there's been quite a bit of time and effort put into this project. Coming up on two years. This, this has pretty much remained the same. This is basically our engineers, architects, structural engineers, uh, our consultants and whatnot that we've used. This hasn't changed. This is basically our action item since the June 26 planning board meeting. Um, Army Corps agreed with a navigational plan on June 26, which was you know the same day as the meeting. Uh, but we couldn't get that information into the meeting because the requirements are due three weeks before that. Uh, the Army permit number is listed on as a second bullet item there. Um, Wade Trim, which is a uh, consulting firm recommended by MDOT, they gave us a list, 20 names. We called, uh, they're, they're the one who called us back first. We hired them and they're one of their approved consulting lists. Uh, they contacted MDOT based on our needs and they request, uh, MDOT requested a traffic impact assessment. Uh, MDOT is very familiar with the road. MDOT is familiar with all the roads. That's their job. They're the authority. Um, they said based on what the consultant was telling them, you know, all that was needed was a traffic impact assessment. Wade, track, uh, Wade Trim submitted a traffic impact assessment and it was approved by MDOT. So at that point we were approved. The planners requested a larger traffic scope with summer and weekend counts uh, after we were already approved by MDOT. So a larger scope was agreed on between us and the planners and that was done on July 29th. We trim perform weekend traffic counts August 16th through the 20th. So still during the summer months, we did it as quickly as we could once we finally got the scope agreed upon. It took quite some time to get the scope where everybody agreed to what the scope should be. Uh, Wade trim analyzed the data once again and submitted their impact study to MDOT. MDOT approved the traffic impact study and summer weekend counts for our usage. Uh, MDOT is not requiring any other off-site improvements to M29 for this development. MDOT issued an approved permit September 26th. Permit numbers listed on the board. And since that last board, uh, we've installed over 400 feet of new seawall with an additional 1,200 foot in progress on the property. 
So as part of the latest plan submittal, we were informed that a full resubmission package with all the plan sheets would be required. The applicant, oh, excuse me, this is, this is uh, part of uh, Giffel's yeah, the first is the, is, is the point they made in the in, the, in their re review. Okay, yeah. And there was a bit of confusion with it because we did ask. There were three, there were three drawings that were changed. Uh, and that was based on MDOT. MDOT asked us to remove the curbs. They once asked us to install curbs. And then they came back and asked us to remove the curbs for safety. So we removed the curbs, which affected three drawings. Um, we asked if, that was, if, if we could just submit those three drawings. Planners did suggest it would be preferred to have a full set, but we could submit the three drawings uh, as long as we noted what the changes were. We went forward with that. There was some confusion we saw the review because it comes back saying, hey, we were required, we didn't perform. Uh, but we have emails back and forth. We thought that was acceptable. We hope it didn't cause any more confusion. Uh, we realized there's been multiple sets. Uh, the, the changes that were submitted in July means we postponed. But the three changes were just the curb remove. Uh, that was the only change on those drawings. Right, and we, we have uh, submitted over the course of time many sets of plans with every change. And every set of plans, the very first page never changes because it's the, the island as it was. So that, that doesn't change. You don't change how it was. It was always the same. The seawall pages, those don't change. Some of the changes that we've had to make is take out event area two, which is you know, taking out the words in the middle there or changing a chart on the page, that only impacts page 3, 3A, 3B, 3C, or whatever it might be. So those were the pages we were changing. Instead of going through and creating a whole new 10-page sheet, we emailed the planners dated 925. Due to the numerous submittals and versions of this plan, we have, uh, we have reviewed clean copies of all the full site plan package are preferred and then later goes on provide a copy of transmittal and any response received from USAC Army Corps. So just, just add that I know there was a big packet of paper emails went back and forth it was our understanding that planners requested just we wanted every single transmittal between the Army Corps and us so we provided every 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 conversation back and forth which is literally an hundred inch, plus an inch pack of, of emails but we want to make sure we, if they wanted to see the communication back and forth we provided that we weren't under the understanding we had to had to basically put a summary together the summary is actually the permit and, it, and the permit goes into pretty good detail so we included the permit also from the uh, Army Corps so that was maybe it was a misunderstanding what was required but it was us that we thought we'd provide all communication with the Army Corps so that's kind of it's a bit confusing but it, that's what that pile of paper is so so that's what they wanted was all of our emails and correspondence to the Army Corps which we provided as, as the planners recommended and I saw confusion and there we realized those numbers do 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 change a bit the the reason was one is from an architect standpoint from a square footage for the building code and the other is parking uh, we know we're limited by parking rather than square footage. So the pool area, the, the, the architect, per the building codes, are, is, is correct uh, for the numbers that is listed there. Although because of the parking limitations, the parking would take precedence, so it would be the smaller number of the two. Uh, which is on the site plan. Which is on the site plan as well. This was based on, uh, the board had recommended at one point to understand what the building code was for the square footage. And so there is a confusion when you get into those larger spaces like the pool area and the event area because of the, there's a lot of acreage out there. So we've, we've uh, just we probably could address that better and make that understanding. But one is square footage and one is parking to help clarify that a bit. Uh, the, the parking hasn't changed. As, as the planners mentioned, there is a, there's a deficit of one. You know, we, if you round up the boating, it's really 3.5. So if you round up the parking and you round up, you either round them up or both up or both down, and I, we get zero. But you can't round one up and one down. It's, the boating at 142 times 25% is 
So if you take those numbers out, it does equal zero. But that's it's really we can work that out if that's a, if that's an issue. We talk about hours of operation. The hours of operation um, permitted for the Transmit Marina. That was a, the, the top outline is basically the concern of the planners. We brought it forward. Our goal on that marina, we, we really want to follow the transit marina. Uh, there's a lot of programs out in the Michigan for Michigan boaters, Michigan DNR boating, the infrastructure program, transit docking. Obviously, to encourage more boating, to encourage people to visit the area. And those are just some listing of items. I know it might be difficult to read some of those, but they want to encourage um, the boating, the boating community, the transit docking, uh, the overnight stay. We don't uh, believe that overnight transit boaters are going to require are going to have cars. Uh, boaters, we've boated transit boaters. Or I boat all over the lake. We have both, and and traditionally I don't send a car to follow me around. But after um, we later discuss, and, and those are some of the strengths we listed. That was for, directly from the DNR list of transient marinas and, and what they expect and, and how they want to promote uh, Michigan Michigan lakes. Yeah, I think it's important to really point out though that if if you're going to a destination, let's say you're going to Browns by boat, you're not going to bring your car with you. You know, it's, you know, you're driving by boat, you want to go by boat, uh, and basically, you know, when someone's coming to Blue Horseshoe Island by boat, they're not going to bring their car. So to use a parking spot, we don't want a boat and a parking, you know, car using up our spots when we are obviously uh, below the count in terms of having enough parking spaces based on the size of our, of the property. You know, going into the, the next the next highlight point was the parking way was an impact special use you know we understand uh, and we want the, the planners to understand it's, it's not a traditional you know marina with boat wells that are seasonally rented or leased you know these are transient these are coming in for the restaurant these are possibly staying for the weekend uh, and that will progress I, I don't think that uh, it will take time to get a transient boat transient boaters to know the area, to understand it, and see the benefits. And so that, that we don't see it's going to be an overnight. Uh, we probably see it more transitional as, as it transitions later uh, to more overnight. At first, we think it's just going to visit the restaurant, have dinner, and leave, stay the evening, stay the afternoon, and whatnot. Um, season, as a season, uh, you know, in respects to boat parking, Obviously, the, uh, we're asking for this review to planners to, you know, the plan is deferred to, obviously, the planning board makes a decision on, on that 25% use for transient boaters. Uh, again, we're asking for that, as we did in the application, uh, to, to approve the maximum amount of 25% uh, required for the parking spaces be supplied by the transit docking facilities. You know, one of the things, too, you know, we are an island. You know, there is a marina, there was a marina there. You know, we're, we're, we've been approved by the Army Corps and the DEQ to, to, to more boats. Um, you know, and people on the, you know, hopefully in this room will want to come enjoy uh, the property, see the sunsets from the property, have something to eat there, uh, be with their friends, these kinds of things. They're going to be coming by boat, showing up on pontoons, whatever. You know, we're going to need to, you know, have space to park the boats for people to come in and use. So that's why the 25%, you know, is requested. You know, we talked about, the, you know, the plan has made a good point about the parking lot paving timeline, the bonds. And that was one another point that was raised in that uh, review. We understand that. We agree with it. We want to back, back off on that and agree to the six-month extension if necessary. Again, it's based on the minute weather, the time if we're needed. So again, we, we are back to saying in this that uh, uh, we accept that, we understand it, and we would like to move forward and accept the six month period uh, if, if, we, if, if necessary. And one of the things too about that is, you know, we're building on an island, you know, we're basically on ground that needs to settle with the parking lot. You know, we put the material down, you know, there's going to be some movement and things like that over time. So, you know, we want to make sure that when we lay that nice cap on top and make it, you know, nice for everyone, 
that it's not going to be waving, cracking, and in disrepair. So if we get some additional time where we're driving on the, the, the gravel lot, which, you know, there's a lot of gravel lots around here in other cities, um, and then we can put the nice coat over the top. I mean, we know that we had high waters this year. It was, it was uh, everything was a bit soggy. We had a very wet spring. The seawalls will help dry that out. Um, and again, the additional material on top. So we understand the, the restrictions on the planning board, and we accept that uh, as, as the ordinance uh, are written. Uh, back to the back to the special land use approval. We've already in the application addressed a lot of those um, those items that were were brought up earlier. You know, the one thing that came back, and of course the police reviewed it, and the police chief uh, Mike Kocheck statement summarized the best. He, and he came out and said basically in writing in 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 the was returned into the board planning board that after his review of the latest information regarding the Blue Horseshoe project. At this time, I, I have no additional concerns, immediate concerns. After reading the traffic, lighting, and sound studies performed, it appears that they are taking the necessary steps to comply with Clay Township ordinances. Now, some of those things, like the sound, you know, we want to know if that sound is going to make a difference. You know, we, we'll buy, we're planning to buy by the ordinances, including the sound ordinances. We did a study with noise coming from those areas and we showed that the last week so that, that's been already proposed. and that that wasn't required or asked for by the planners we did that on our own we went out and hired a firm out of Ann Arbor uh, soundscape engineering uh, they performed a computer generated model you know that that determines the sound and you know takes in all the factors based on the site location uh, and basically uh, their numbers came back you know well below what the street noise level is, uh, which is basically, you know, Stark Road's a thousand feet away, and based on that, you know, if it's at a certain level, this is what it's at. So we want to be below that level, you know, we want uh, this, you know, not to disrupt any of our neighbors. You know, MDOT, we went to MDOT, and as part of that uh, conclusion of the traffic study, and going back to uh, placing the bond for MDOT, and we've got now that we received the permit, permit number. So that is for the driveway. The bond is placed for the driveway and, and the approach. Uh, we've had several meetings with MDOT. We've had uh, communication with our, it's really our engineers that are hired to do that, although we were, we were attend, most, attended most of those meetings. Um, and that permit was issued, and you can see the dates on that. With the permit number there. You know, back on this traffic assessment, it's a lot of detail here, and it's really the, it's, so our traffic consultant read the review, the planner's review, and spoke with MDOT, and there, there were some, some, we can go through and definitely read this, I mean, the, uh, Yeah, know, I think, I think basically, um, you know, Way Trim, our consulting firm, uh, we, we got this paper that you guys saw that uh, Giffels put up there, and there were some things that, uh, they responded, weight trim responded in red here. Okay, so uh, first bullet point based on, this is from Way, uh, Giffels, based on the counts taken by the applicant's consultant August 16th through the 20th, Saturday had the highest volume of 15,347 vehicles per day on Dyke Road. The highest hourly count on Friday was 1,200 vehicles from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And the highest hourly count on Saturday was 1,139 vehicles from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Okay, I think you already heard that, he said that, but the response from Wade Trim, uh, there appears to be a statement of fact taken from the traffic study. However, the actual traffic count shows that Friday has the highest volume with 15,347 vehicles per day. Saturday's volume was 14,936. So maybe that was a typo. He should have put Friday in there instead of Saturday, or maybe he should have put the 14,000. So that was incorrect based on the actual traffic study that was conducted. The second bullet point they had, the traffic study suggests that no more than 65% of the vehicles will arrive and leave during the peak hour, which would mean a maximum of 68 hourly trips, which would be 106 times 0.65. The study assumes 50% are entering and 50% are exiting during the peak hour. 
way Trim's response to that bullet point from Giffels Webster is, the peak hours determined as the 60 minute period with the highest number of vehicles. It is realistic to assume that 65% of the total trips or 68 trips would occur during the peak hour. If the island only has a restaurant, then the number of trips entering and exiting during the morning and evening peak hour would be 23 entering and 19 exiting during the morning peak and 26 entering and 15 exiting during the evening peak hours. Only during the Saturday peak hour is 50% entering and 50% exiting. Never does the restaurant generate 68 trips. The restaurant's maximum number of trips is 48 because there are no because there are no other events that would generate 68 trips, a 50% entering and 50% exiting was used to estimate the highest number of vehicle trips. Now this is a lot of words, but this is what MDOT is the authority on. These are the numbers that they based on the hundreds of thousands of restaurants and terms going in and out and how much in time, and this is, this is basically the facts of what their consultants are saying. And then there's a whole other page here, but uh, uh, another bullet point from Giffels was the proposed development development is planned for build out in summer of 2022. Therefore, a minimum growth rate should be applied to forecast 2022 traffic volumes. MDOT TDMS provides historical traffic counts on Dyke Road by the site driveway. The annual growth rate from 2014 to 2019 is 5.2. A minimum range of a half a percent to two percent growth rate is recommended. However, an appropriate growth rate should be obtained from MDOT personnel for the purpose of this study. Okay. And Wade Trim's response is: We contacted Michael Erickson, who is MDOT, who works for MDOT. Uh, he's the permanent engineer for MDOT for the Huron TSC. And after talking to the other personnel in his office, concluded that one percent growth rate should be used. No. And another note to note is. Our build out is projected for 2020, not 2022. Um, unless, you know, there's, you know, plans to, to have a bunch more uh, planning board meetings. We, we would like to start next year to build the restaurant and feel that we can get that done next year and be open by next year. It's not a big restaurant. It's about 4,500 square feet. So it's smaller than uh, Bobby Max restaurant. And then the other bullet point from Giffels was the left turn auxiliary lane chart is provided by MDAT is based on total development. Therefore, the, the site generated trips and any background growth rate trips should be added to the forecast in two-way 24-hour volume. The plot of point in the chart falls closer to the threshold, which would indicate the eventual need for a left turn accommodation. Also, would a large wedding event where guests arrive within one hour of the ceremony and most stay until later in the evening have an impact on the assumptions related to inbound left and right turns. And then Giffels responded, or uh, excuse me, Wade Trim responded, if you apply a 1% growth rate to the 15,347 vehicles for a two-year period, then by 2022, you would expect 15,655 vehicles. As you can tell, by viewing the MDOT chart, the 15,655 lies very close to 15,347, which means a passing flare is still not needed. One can make a variety of assumptions concerning arrivals and departures at a large wedding, but keep in mind weddings are not random events occurring all hours of day or night. Weddings are planned events, and as mentioned a number of times in our submittal documents, when a wedding is planned, one of the many items our staff will discuss is uh, the vehicle access during the wedding and alternatives for vehicle access, assuming it's a large wedding. So during the planning of the wedding and the wedding day and all that kind of stuff, we're gonna be talking about how many are your people coming by boat? How many are people coming by car? If you only have this many cars to come in and that's it, parking passes can be issued on larger events. Should we be fortunate to have a larger wedding for somebody in the area who wants to have you know, their, their kid get married? Great. Now, uh, just to clarify, so this is the this is the actual drawing that was uh, which we the drawing that was shown earlier was a drawing that we proposed to the Army Corps. The Army Corps spent about a year of investigation, and they were pretty thorough. We went back and had several meetings. They asked several questions. Obviously, you see a, a two inches of email. 
uh, back and forth. Plus, that doesn't count the meetings that we had. What we agreed to at the final, navigation was a big concern of theirs, uh, especially on the north end with the residents there. We'd agree to keep that north end clear, post signs. We also agreed, agreed not to extend on the east side past 30 feet. So uh, they do a f by foot, so that depends on a boat. If you have a, uh, there are boats that uh, are, are eight foot wide, and there's boats that are 20 foot wide. So it would, it would be not to exceed that seawall limit. The current docking there is 40 foot. So what we actually do is, when we knock out that old docks that still exists today, we'll actually increase the uh, canal by 10 foot on that east side. Uh, and we're limited by the extent of the, um, of, of the, of course, from, from the 30 foot from the seawall. As we get narrow, we drop it down. On the south side, we, have, we, have, we own the property on both sides of that, of that south shore. And depending on the numbers offhand that are listed on that map, there's, several, there's still 100 feet uh, rafted in. Now, when the Army Corps asked us to do this, we, they said, give us the worst case. So it looks a bit silly to have all these boats rafted up. And to have something like this would be a, probably an absolute rare, rare, rare opportunity to fill up that many boats. Uh, to kind of get an idea, a Brown's restaurant has about 60, rest, six, about 60 parking wells for boats. I have seen it filled on, on busy weekends and, and some fundraisers they do with uh, poker runs and whatnot. They can fill all, all, all 60 spots. <coughs> They're also on one acre compared to almost five acres. So we've got about uh, 3,000, over 3,000 of footage around that. Uh, and we eliminate, still eliminate the 500 on the north end and eliminate pretty much the front. We, we still land about 25, 2,600 feet of, uh, of, of, of shore. And of that shore, boat parking will be on about, uh, there's about 1,600 feet of seawall been approved by the Army Corps. And the Army Corps spent a lot of time going over this back and forth, believe you me. Um, you know, there's, there was a lot of work involved to make this right. Um, you know, the docks that are currently there are sticking out 40 feet, as he said. We gave up 10 foot of that to bring it in tighter. Um, you know, and we listened to some of the concerns from some of the people on Stark Drive that are here tonight and we took off uh, any docking on the North Shore, keep that whole channel open. That was a concern. We took care of it. So basically we gave up part of our frontage and agreed not to park any boats there because, uh, you know, it was good for the community and we don't want to have any problems with navigation in that canal, you know. Uh, so, and then as Brian said, the bottom south channel, south pond, uh, you know, we own both sides and we're allowed to park in that area as, as we have to sign here. The previous map that was on the first slide was not the correct map in the, uh, in the emails that was agreed upon by the Army Corps. This is the correct map. Some of the other stipulations they asked for, they want posted signs, of course, every 50 foot intervals on the north side, the no boat parking, make people that are coming in at any time realize there's no parking allowed. Uh, they've also asked for that same signage put on the, on the east shore of the channel not to exceed the 30 foot. And although there's not a, a number for it, they also want a uh, representative out there working those docks on the busy days. So people aren't parking, they're parking outside of these requirements. And the, uh, the boats that are listed there, basically Brian took a boat that was on the property, so it was pr to scale, and put those in there. Those I believe are 28 footers or? No, I think that's a, those, that, we use one that was on scale, was on the island. So there's one on the island, you can kind of see it. It's a sto it was stored there that, that year. It's a, it's a 34 C rig, so we use that. I would think the average is probably below that for boats and, uh, on the lake. But uh, we use a 34 C rig and got, and got those. I think there's 106 boats. Obviously, boats, every boat's different size and width. But those are bigger boats, and then we think we're going to get 106 34 foot C rigs around. You know. They're going to be smaller center councils, things like that, pontoons in the area. Uh, I know there's some input uh, regarding the plan of the uh, storm runoff. Back in December, the, uh, the, the engineering staff from Project Control submitted to the township uh, their thoughts in regards to the drainage, the sewage, the water system, and the uh, Made it, made it clear that a, a retention pond was not required 
for this property, for this development. They do require a, um, uh, a pre-treatment requirement, and we submitted that to, the, there's a drawing there, we submitted that to both the city, uh, the township, and to the uh, engineers at uh, Project Control. We also follow up and, and email the planners in, uh, I believe, early March, March 19th, and then we followed up in putting that, that uh, disclaimer at the bottom uh, in both the applications of April and July. We didn't put it on the site plan. Our, our, it is on our mechanical drawings uh, that will be submitted to the building. Our engineers uh, basically made the claim that this, this, that, that portion is not, is, will be in the mechanical drawings and not on the site plan. So we thought we addressed that. It keeps coming up. We hope we address it. If we need more information on that, uh, we can provide that, so, but the, uh, both the township engineering team and our engineering team come to the conclusion of the system that uh, will meet the ordinances. And as you all know, you know, there are no storm sewers in clay, so water on dike roads pouring off, you know, uh, we will have a, uh, an item that's going to be in the parking lot, which, which is approved, and we've already discussed this in previous meetings. It's like a catch basin. Basically, all the drains will drain into one catch basin. That catch basin will pre-treat that water, and then it will pump into the pump into the lake. Uh, when it comes down to the development where we've gone, we've got the DEQ approval. We've talked about many of these. Uh, the Army Corps has now approved us. It wasn't since our last last meeting, planning board meeting. Uh, we, we were approved the following day. We knew it was closed, but we, we didn't have the actual permit yet. Uh, our traffic input study was was approved. Um, by MDOT, obviously by, by, by the permit. Uh, Michigan Liquor Control approved the liquor license for the property. Um, and now, it's, that's what it, now it's sitting in an escrow, waiting, waiting to move forward. Uh, Clay Township Police approved it. Uh, their along, checklist. along with the fire, their checklist that been turned into the township. Uh, soil erosion permit's been, been approved and uh, posted. Uh, our sound study was approved. You know, by our engineers, also in, by the uh, police reviewed that. Uh, structure being approved, we had a structural ar architects out on the bridge uh, for what it was, as it sits now. We had, we had concerns about moving heavy equipment across. It was approved for now, and as we approved, approved that bridge, at, uh, the, they looked at those plans and approved that, and that was approved. Uh, the sanitary system, the engineers came back and said the system can handle develop, the current system can handle that uh, this development so that was approved, and also the distribution of water. Uh, they came back and said the water system couldn't handle the development like we're proposing. When it comes down to it, the summary, uh, as as was mentioned earlier, in summary, we're asking the planning board to approve the planning uh, proposed as 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 the action be taken. We approve the special approve the special land use as uh, the site plan as presented, with no conditions except for paving the lot uh, as required. You know, and in closing too, you know, in terms of our presentation, you know, um, you know, we want to put together a nice project here. Uh, the township tried to buy the property from the Lupinskis uh, at one time, and they wanted to make something for the community. Um, it's been said to me by several different people, some that work uh, here at the township, that you know we don't have anything fun around here. Um, we're trying to make a nice place. We're trying to take consideration in terms of our neighbors and things like that. We're trying to follow every ordinance you know, that we can, uh, and we're, you know, basically, we're in a meeting, and then we, you know, we get something from Giffels a, a day or two after the meeting, and then we got to hurry up, get something done in four or five days, and get it turned back in. You know, we've, we've ran as fast as we could, including turning this presentation around within two days. Um, you know, we want to get things done, we want to do it right, and, you know, we feel that this would be a real asset to the community. There's things that we want to do, you know, for the community and for the police and fire. I, I saw some of them here earlier, but they left. Um, you know, we want to do things that, that are charitable type events where, uh, you know, maybe we have a special event and, and some proceeds go towards, you know, some type of charities in this area. A big part of what we, we are behind is Safe Lake St. Clair. Brian and I both live on the lake. You know, I, you know, we own one of the biggest properties in Clay Township and you know I own a house on Marina Drive in Clay Township um, you know I'm a landowner in Clay Township uh, you know and I want to put my own money in here 
you know, and we want to together uh, make a plan to put together something that's going to be uh, well run, good food, you know, and, and good events. Um, we don't want troublemakers coming. We don't want people coming blasting the radio. You know, we want to know who's, you know, who's disrupting the system, and we're going to talk to them. I'm going to work there. My wife's going to work there. Brian's going to work there. You know, we're going to be there to make sure that uh, this thing is going to operate nicely and be an asset to the community. I know that Clay Township <clears throat> has lost, you know, a, a, you know, the boat dealership colony on the corner there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, some of the restaurants around, but I think, um, sorry, I'm losing my voice. But um, I think this is something that you guys would be proud of, uh, and it would be an asset to the community. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, women. Thank you. I just want to make two very important corrections. I'm not going to go through every item and provide a response. Okay. But there are two things that were said that were incorrect and I need to correct them. In the very beginning of the presentation, the applicant said that they've written checks to Giffels. I make it very clear. There have been zero checks from the applicant written to Giffels Webster. The way the process works for this application and every other applicant that comes before the township is they submit applications to the township, they pay the township whatever the township chooses to charge as an application fee. That covers things like administration and it covers the fee of consultants, including planners and engineers. We submit an invoice to the township for what are our charges as your consultant. There are no checks written from the applicant to Gibbles Webster. I want to make sure everyone is very clear about that. Number two. The traffic impact study. The applicant was puzzled how we referred to a 2022 opening. Um, I have the applicant's traffic study prepared by their consultant, and I'm just going to quote it. It says that the 4,210 square foot restaurant is going to open late 2020 or early 2021. The event area with 424 persons is proposed to open in 2020 or early 2021. The pool area will open in late summer, or excuse me, in the summer of 2022, and the pool dock and patio area with 223 people will be open in the summer of 2022. So we got the time, 2022, from the applicant himself. Okay, so just to make sure everyone's clear where the information is coming from, this is what's given to us, and that's what we have provided and was the basis for some of our information. Thank you for those two clarifications. I am now going to turn to um, public comments. Anybody, actually, do you mind? Or maybe, Harold, do you want to turn light on? We'll let him have lights this time. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I see somebody's really anxious to show up. We're going to try to do this in early fashion. Please keep in mind the rules that Christine read as far as three minutes and six minutes. Um, tonight, Tom Hosell is going to be our timekeeper. When you come to the podium, please state your name and you are representing a group or an individual. And we will proceed, hopefully, in a very early fashion. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're Gary and Alec on behalf of some of the property owners in the neighborhood who are opposed to this and have considerable concerns. And also, part of we feel the due process to the neighbors is violated when the applicant comes tonight with new data that the people in the public nor yourself have an opportunity to digest. Now, the planner did provide us his report that came out on Friday, and I circulated that to the people in the area. The, uh, because they got a permit from the DEQ or the Corps doesn't mean that you have to approve their special land use. And I've been in contact with the Corps and the DEQ, and they responded to me back in April after they gave their, uh, the DEQ did, gave their permit. It says, many of the issues raised are for other agencies to review and approve if appropriate. So I'll give you that letter, and I'll give a copy to the uh, applicant so he knows what's transpired, so I, I highlighted that <coughs> for Can I ask a favor of you? Could you hand a copy to the secretary? Oh, yes. Thank you. Today is the 23rd. 
Back in June of this year, I corresponded with your group as to concerns of my clients, and I pointed out and attached to it some summaries of your ordinance that as to this particular situation and the special approval land use criteria, but I also pointed out that if this is considered a recreational facility, you have to have a minimum of 10 acres. On page 161, section 2043 of your ordinance says recreational commercial outdoor activities. It says you need a minimum of 10 acres for amphitheater, amusement parks, resorts, and campgrounds, and similar items with a minimum width of 600 feet. All of their submissions say it's four acres. Your planner says it's four acres. Now, the aerials over time show that the island has diminished in size, but basically their plan says a land above the water that's going to go inside their seawall and the riprap is the four acres. So I don't think you can approve this because they don't meet the minimum size requirement. Now, <coughs> excuse me, Wade Trim did issue a report on the traffic back on May 31st, 2019. And page five had the aerial and it was somewhat similar to the one aerial that your planner had. And the traffic counts, you know, you need engineers to make assessments to give you information. But one of the things that we've said in the past and the neighbors have said in the past, if you visit the site, the site distance when you come out of that driveway that leads to their bridge is significantly restricted by the bridge abutment and the guardrail. So when you're pulling out, whether you're going to go left and west towards Fairhaven or if you're going to go east towards Elkanac, you have that bridge abutment and guardrail. And none of those studies have addressed that. And I'll give you, this was page five from that report. And presumably you have that already, but as a matter of convenience. It clearly shows the concrete bridge abutment and the guardrail leading down to Bill Rose's facility. So when you come out of that facility, their facility, you're on an uphill climb, you're going to turn right or left, your visibility to the left is significantly impaired. Now if you go to Fairhaven, Ira Township, there's that Dollar General store, this side, they end up made that facility put in the left turn lane. Well, if you have a wedding or some other special event here, whether you're coming from the east or west, there's going to be left turns. When you go to Dollar General, it's not a specific event, so I would think from a common sense perspective that the traffic flow is intermittent. But if you have an event, a wedding, people are going to show up within a half hour time frame of the scheduled event, and that's when you're going to have these issues. The, uh, in conjunction with the traffic situation, in that area, you have a traffic light at Palms Road to interrupt traffic flow, and the next light is down at the ferry. There's not one, you, one where you come off an Anchor Bay Drive, there's that warning light. So without traffic lights in close proximity, you don't get gaps in the traffic flow. And that, that to me, adds to a, a safety issue. The, uh, and once we 30 seconds. I just want to give you some uh, photographs of what the bay looks like in the summertime already because those are navigational issues and I'd like these pictures back that you can circulate them amongst yourselves. And part of your master plan says it's important to preserve the natural features because in your community, just like Chesterfield and Baltimore, you have a lot of wetlands because you're along the water, you're along the river, and this significantly impacts it. 
And in their study, in their core permit, because I've had discussions with them, they show rafting off four bulls. Well, if you're all buddies and you tie up next to each other, you might not care if somebody goes across your boat. But I suspect if you're a boater, you're not going to like somebody if you're the first guy in the dock, three boats or two boats or one boat next to you to get from their boat to the dock. And in my previous letters, at the far end, up in here, if there's a fire up here and there's boats, how does the fire department get to it? And in their submission before, they said that they were going to use portable johns to facilitate lavatory needs, which seems kind of far-fetched. I want to ask you to try to wrap it up. Okay. As so we would like you to either postpone it so that you and us have an opportunity to review this new data in the core permit data or deny it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the public who wishes to come forward and speak? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Diane Miller, 7311 B Lane, and I'm speaking on behalf of several of the residents back in the Steyer Sub or Perch Point Isles, as it's referred to in our in our ordinances. Um, one thing that I've asked a couple of times was whether the Planning Commission has actually made a site visit. Has anyone gone there? As a group, you've made a site visit. Was that advertised? not what we do. Um, Planning Commission Handbook says that if you're going to make a site visit that it's supposed to be advertised and the whole group goes together to visit it. But anyway, uh, I'm wondering why we continue to entertain a swim up bar. Um, the state of Michigan rule R325.2192 subparagraph 9 states that alcohol cannot be served in any pool in the state of Michigan. So paragraph 10 says that no one can enter a swimming pool after they have consumed alcohol. So I'm not sure why we continue to entertain a swim up bar at this location. Um, also, in regards to the boat traffic study, um, I don't know if that picture can be put up there, but down at the bottom where they showed the two boats, where you come underneath of the bridge, there's a building right on that right-hand corner as you, as you come out from the bridge and you go to make a right-hand turn. So as you're coming out from that bridge to turn right to, to go through the Boobia uh, Creek where the Blue Wave Kayak Trail is and where the boats will be rafted off over here, it's very, very poor visibility currently. Um, boats that are 40 foot long and they're, and they're docked head into a seawall, it's very easy for them to back out and maneuver out in either direction. Now, when you're rafted off side by side, when these boats come in, they're going to have to turn around and then dock uh, to do a sidewall docking. The only location that is wide enough for them to turn around is right there at the mouth of the bridge where the 150 people that are homes, more people, 150 homes back in the Steyer sub come under that bridge in order to go out to the bay. So that's going to be a very, very congested area there and in my opinion at least eight to ten rows where they show double parking should be only single allowed. They have requested that there be no restrictions placed on the, on the uh, transient marina. I believe that we do need to, uh, to issue restrictions because the Corps of Engineers has said they can go out 30 feet. So if they're allowed to go out 30 feet and we don't put a restriction that says no they can't, they will and we will have problems with boat accidents with people trying to turn around in that limited area there. Um, and the transient parking marina, our ordinances are pretty clear about overnight parking, 
for the transient marinas, I, I, I believe that that should be a request for a waiver of our ordinance if we're not going to add the parking for the transient marina. Thank you. Thank you. I know I ran out of time. No, no you're fine. fine. You're fine. Oh, I thought it was out of time. Well, we had a misunderstanding. You could, you could, you could get another minute or something. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I knew you wanted. <laughs> okay, I was trying to we'll rush through that. We'll give you two minutes. Room since room we had this <laughs> Excuse me, I got lost on my train of thought. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah, the Corps of Engineers area. So um, they say 136 volts, but then they said that they had used 34 foot volts. They anticipate smaller boats. That means that there's actually going to be more boats parked there. And I know for a fact that if you allow transient overnight docking, that people from other areas are going to drive to that marina, they're going to park and jump on a boat and go out and enjoy a weekend because they don't have their own boat. We'll meet you at the island. And we're going to need that parking. And that's all I can think of right now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next member of the audience, sir. <coughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is Keith Stein, and I'm at 7889STAR. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the board for giving me the opportunity to speak. And a lot of things have been rehashed over the last several months regarding this project, so I won't, I won't repeat those. And in an effort to be quick, uh, I'll just address a couple points. One is uh, that island prior to the purchase was used for all sorts of things, including dumping all kinds of uh, boat parts, oil, gas, uh, whatnot. The concern that the residents in the area have is that if there's going to be a, resident, a restaurant built there and a facility that uh, hundreds of people are going to be uh, exposed to, how are we going to protect the community from the hazards of the environmental waste that's on that island? And has there been any kind of environmental studies to protect the community for uh, when this building is built and the digging up of this uh, property is commenced. We already have a situation where in this particular area, the cancer rates are amongst the highest in the state. We have people on our street and start who are already battling cancer. We do not need a situation where stuff is dredged up and, uh, and, and impacts the quality of the air that we all breathe. The, the other issue related to that is, according to their plans, there appears to be a spot on the island that the housing material will be pulled and pooled at. And this, this will be, I believe, seven feet high, uh, according to the plans. So this is going to be soil that comes from the lake, the bottom of the lake, which is where all the contaminants rest. So we're going to be pulling out this <coughs> contaminated soil and leaving it in front of my neighbor's homes. I think that's an unacceptable solution. And lastly, I just want to reiterate what was previously said about uh, a comment that the applicants had said that people will come by boat and they won't have cars. Uh, people will join them with cars. So, thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you for coming. Thanks for your comments. Anybody else in the audience who would like to make a comment? My name is Steve Harrison. I live on the Baby Shores area. There is somewhat affected by your plans. Um, all I hear is what a benefit this is going to bring to this community. I, I try to see that because I already got many restaurants I go to, and you talk about a wedding destination. Uh, I, I just don't see a lot of people wanting to come out here for a wedding, even when most of the people that you're trying to attract out here might be driving home in some abbreviated uh, uh, condition. You talk about the peak traffic, always the peak traffic. I don't really care about the peak traffic, it's all the traffic. 
Sir, can I ask you to pick, speak into the microphone okay. a little more? Thank I you. don't really care about, the, the, the peak traffic is a, is a concern, but there's other traffic. There's a 2 a.m. traffic. There's the 11 o'clock traffic. It's a drunk driver traffic. It's a drunk driver driving down the street, coming up to that bridge with the poor visibility. That's the traffic I'm concerned about. And when it comes to the boating, you know, the, you say, every, all I ever hear is the benefits, but all we need is another variance for this, another variance for this, another variance for this. But when it comes to the safety of the traffic, we're not gonna, we're just gonna do the minimum, whatever the DNR or the MDOT says, we'll do the minimum of that. If you really wanted to make a point and what a benefit this was, you would say, we are gonna redo that bridge. We are gonna add a left turn lane to ensure this doesn't happen. Not, well, we don't have to do that because MDOT doesn't say it's required. To me, that doesn't show like, this is what you, you want. You're concerned about the people rather than the business that you're trying to jam into this. And it's very appropriate that it's a blue horseshoe because this makes me sick. And you're horseshoeing a resort into a bedroom community where there was none before. You say there was a marina, but there's a reason why there's no marina there anymore. It didn't make it. And a lot of these, I, I could go to down the street to a wedding chapel at a marina. I see the sign every day. I enjoy driving in and out at Bogey Bear, and this is rentable for, for uh, weddings. And to think that nobody's, when they go to spend the night, they're not going to crank up their stereos. Now I got to cut the cops from Clay Township to go tell, tell the guy to turn down the stereo. Don't I got to worry about what else is happening in the prime? That I got to worry about the transient guy who's all of a sudden gets to spend the night in somebody's backyard cranking up their stereo? We know this happens. This is boaters. We are all boaters. We all do it. But now it's going to be in people's backyards so that you can have a restaurant to hang out in. I appreciate the fact that you want to bring money and investment into this area, but hey, Parsons Island is right across the way, man. They got a whole boys club over there that you can put it in over there. I don't know why that didn't go through, but all of a sudden it, we're going to take that, you know, that kind of Sir, investment and put it over in this neighborhood. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I got to ask well, you to wrap it up. Your time's up. Well, I'm just about done anyway, so I appreciate the time. So, well, uh, there's a lot to say, comments, and uh, I think that woman said it best. But you know, th this is. You're jamming something in. You're jamming something. Every time you ask for a variance, you're jamming it in. Thank you. Any other members of the audience who wants to come forward? What? Oh, I didn't see her. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Scott Walgraves, Dr. Wright. Um, I just have one comment that um, back in 2012, your master plan says we're already overbuilt by 50% marinas. Do we really need another one? That's just my question, my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Was there someone in the second row? My name is Linda Froin, 7770 Phillips Drive, and in response to what Mr. Harrison said and the lady over here with the boats, I, on Phillips Drive, we've got all the boats all summer long behind us, hundreds, and they say that they're in the boats, people don't come and visit. We have people coming across their property they come to the seawall, pick their friends up. We're asking them to stay off our property. We've even had pizza deliveries and sub deliveries that we've had to kick, kick off our lots. And they're right there. And to enjoy the sunsets, which I have a perfect view, I can. Because all the voters with all the different radio stations you can't even hear yourself think, let alone talk out back. So that's my concern. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience? <clears throat> Very back row. Hello, my name is 
Mal May, and I live on 8841 Anchor Bay Drive. And I do have a big question about how this establishment will be in harmony with this area. We have one of the very few wet prairies left in the world, and it would be great that we focus on that and being proud of that, rather than a restaurant, which we have plenty of in this world. Um, I did some very quick math, which is not my strength, and we're 400 people in the event hall, 300 boats, uh, 300 from the boats, which there might be 100 of, so a few people per boat. It might result in 800 people in total. That's almost 1,000 people, and there, some of them might be coming to a wedding. What happens at 10 o'clock after a wedding? Everybody is celebrating their life out, right? You know, they want to celebrate like they're not going to celebrate for the next 20 years. And those people are very hard to keep quiet. And it's going to be a great detriment to the residents. And I think it's very clear that the community doesn't want it. Thank you so much. Any other members in the audience like to come forward? My name is Annette Heiser and I live on Flamingo Road and I just have a couple comments to make. Um, first, um, a comment somebody made about the uh, transit marinas and can't spend the night. Well, I believe the Alvinick Harbor Club has quite a few transit marinas or boat spaces that people spend the night there. I also believe the North Channel Yacht Club is transit and they spend the night there, the week there, the weekends there. Um, that's a couple things. There's a lot of overnight going on there. And um, uh, the, the people from the uh, Phelps Road area, they're off of Anchor Bay Drive. They're a half a mile, about about a half a mile from the island. They're not that close to the island. What? Well, a quarter, maybe a quarter mile to a half a mile from the island. So they're quite a ways away from the island. The audience, please keep it down so we can hear it. Thank you. Um, and another thing, you know, this community, I can't remember the last time we had a brand new business come in and build brand new facilities and brand new buildings in Clay Township. I can't think of a brand new building, a brand new facility. You know, there's nothing new here for somebody to say, yeah, that's an up and coming community. Things are developing, things are coming alive, there's things to do there. Well, there's not a lot to do here in Clay Township, and there's not that many restaurants around. And if you do go to one, you have to wait a long time because the lines are so long. Um, so I guess that's all I wanted to say. We just need something, some new development in this community to bring up our property values. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? The gentleman is standing. I'm Daniel Sterling. I live on Island Drive, 9427. I'm an avid boater. Lots of friends on the other side of the lake. There's no destination places on this side. There's, we live in a waterland, and there's nowhere to enjoy it. Everything's been torn down and built condominiums. We don't have any new places, like she said. All the restaurants, I've been here 30 years, all the restaurants are gone. We're down to a handful. They said we're out of liquor licenses, won't give one that's always had one, which always had a license the whole time we're here. How do we have, are we out of liquor licenses when all the restaurants and bars are closed? We only have two. So we need places like this. This is a lake, we go down to Florida, we go places where you can enjoy the water. The public cannot enjoy the water here. The people from the other side of the lake cannot come here on boats and enjoy the water. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to make a comment? All right, I'll ask one more time. Anybody else on the uh, gentleman in the back? Hello, my name is George Colson. Uh, live on uh, 7352 Ed Lane Road. 
And several people talked about the noise from the boats. Has anybody done a study uh, that uh, the level of noise at Munchie Bay that a lot of these folks have to endure in their backyard? What the, what is that level? And extrapolate it out once you add all these other boats and all their buddies that come see them. And what's that noise level going to be? I can tell you right now that uh, there's a restaurant that just opened up, not reopened not too long ago. I think it used to be called the Sandbar. Mm -hmm. And Saturday night, when they start playing, you know, they stop when they're supposed to. That's cool and all. But from the minute they start to the minute they quit, you can't hear any wildlife. And I like some of the music that they play, but I don't want it just drowned out. When we're talking about Liberty Band, we're not talking about a big venue, you know. So that's just some concerns. Uh, that's it. Can I ask you a question real quick? Sure. It's called the Rocks now. Yeah. 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 Um, is it outdoor entertainment there? Yeah. Well, I heard a band, so I assumed it was outside. <laughs> Does anybody know? I think there is a couple one times. Outside, yeah. outside band. I mean, last, words, last Saturday night there was one out there. Okay, thank you for that information. Sorry to interrupt. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else in the audience who would like to make a comment? <laughs> okay, we're going to have some guys who would like to come forward to make a public comment. I see no hands. So. I am going to turn to the Planning Commission members. As um, you know, we have our packet and our, re our review that's been provided to us. We have um, items that have been covered in that review. We have responses. I we don't have responses in writing from the applicant, as far as I know, in response to that review letter. We've seen it here. So with that, if anybody has questions, you also know our options as far as the public hearing. And this is one of those projects that we've um, kept the public hearing open for, what is it now, like six months? Is that where we're at? Uh, six months. So February was the first meeting, yes. So I guess I'll go with any commission members, any questions? I've got it. Go ahead. Question. Um, for the overnight dockage, and how long would they stay? I do think people drive up and park there, and I think that's going to cause a problem. Is there any guarantee anything you can do to stipulate that they can't oh, we, do that? In our, in our, we did talk. We did have it posted. That we didn't get too much detail on that. I mean, typically, I would say that people come for a weekend, a Friday or night or a Saturday night, and leave. There are some places that have a maximum stay for, for transit marine that would exceed. Uh, there are certain marines I've been to have a maximum stay of, of 15 days or five days or three days. It depends where you go. Mackinac, Mackinac Island, I think it's four days, but three or four days. So it depends. Uh, you know, our cases, we don't want, we're not looking for monthly renters to, to right, drive right, right. cars. So if, if someone comes from up north, they may stay a long week. Uh, it depends on the, if there's enough entertainment to, to, to keep someone busy in the area. For that, for that but you're looking for a waiver on the on the parking with the boats. So if a guy comes, we're with looking for and yeah, we're, we're, we're looking the car. for to be treated as a, as a transit as a transit marina where it's more like parking for the day or, or even for the night, not for a, m a month. That's what we're looking for. for the boat, right. we don't want a seasonal. Understand because that that takes up parking spots that we don't right. have to give away. So when we have transient voters, they're not bringing their car, but maybe a friend comes. But that would be one of the people who use the restaurant or something like that. We don't want their car staying overnight, you know, those kinds right. of things. So right. that's not right. a plan. Customers are not going to be able to go to the restaurant and stick right. keep their cars there overnight right. or sleep in their cars. You know, they can stay on their boats. You know, and when voters go to a destination. You know, they'll go and bring their supplies, you know, food or whatnot, their shampoo, you know, things like that, shower and coat, um, those kinds of things. So 
we're going to be policing as long as the cars couldn't stay overnight. Yeah, we don't we don't want cars staying there taking up our valuable spots. We don't want people meeting people there. Um, we know that some people want to try to do that, but we're going to be on top of that. You know, in terms of we have limited spots. I just police that. You know, it's a difficult thing to police. I mean, we have friends that have multiple restaurants on the lake, and we probably you know three or four different uh, companies that own own restaurants in the lake, and it's it's a full time job to police that because you know it would be bumpers or crews in or or you know a Browns. There are going to be that case where someone wants to drop that car off and jump on a boat. So it's it's a matter of police. They 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 you got to watch it. They have staff out there, especially on those days on Saturday afternoons and Saturday, watching people where they're going and and you know obviously they're not allowing coolers walking down the you know to, to the docks or what. And we're going to know whose boats are whose boats. We're going to get to know everybody and we're going to know who's coming in and we're going to know whose cars are coming in. If there's a car there overnight, we're going to be keeping an eye on who's doing the walk of shame. You know. So gonna, what are your specific plans for the Transit Marina? What, are, what hours are you proposing to us? Well, we, we posted that the Transit Marina would be managed from approximately 11 a.m. till 7 p.m. at night. And that's where someone would be there to, to, to block those people in, to, to, collect, to collect, you know, sign them in. There's a, probably a form, sign in form, and uh, collect the funds. If there's well, nobody after stuff. Well, the bar, restaurant would be open, you know, serving the food and so on. But in terms of having someone working a desk, you know, type of type of thing specific for that, a harbor master, good point. You know. Yeah, that would determine on on if we can get the trash. You know, if, if there actually is a, a need for it. Are you going to have a charge for the uh, transient uh, boats? Not daily, or, weekly, or daily? We, we actually see that maybe evolving on itself. We don't think there's going to be attraction for an overnight stay at first for, for long periods. If there's an event, uh, then we may do something. If we provide electric and water, there'll be maybe a charge. So at first, obviously, just getting started, we want to attract business to the, to the restaurant. Uh, and we may also put certain areas that will be dedicated to, to overnight stay. Are you going to put out notification that there'll be no overnight parking of vehicles? Oh, that's available. Yeah, we could do that. We will to do that. Can I? I'm no longer versed in the art of simulation, and so I tried to look at Synchro and what they did for us in the traffic study. If I read this correctly, uh, they want me to think of that as a spreadsheet that can be updated every second, but it is not a simulation that is run as the traffic moves with the transient traffic that goes into your facility coming in. Is that correct? Are you talking about the adjoining lot? No, I'm talking about the simulation of Synchro. Synchro is a traffic study that was used to tell us what's going on and when I looked at that, uh, they advised people to use synchro slash sim, and I presume it stands for simulation. And I unfortunately looked at my simulation manual this afternoon, and I am no longer able to write these things, but I would envision if you have a traffic study, as I had in a manufacturing system, you need a continuous flow of what you have coming and what is going entering into that flow. And I don't see that as being done or having been done because somewhere in the study it says it's a 0.3 second delay for turning left into your driveway. Uh, I remember when they fixed bridge going into Sassy Marine and I had occasion to go there I can guarantee when that bridge had a red light, as you will when you close the parking lot, it took me longer than three seconds to understand that I couldn't turn, and then I had to wait to turn. I am definitely concerned with your attempt to limit parking when the lot is full. I don't know what that will do to the right turns, 
the left turns, and I don't think that was part of the traffic study. So I believe that the traffic study, based upon your determination of the traffic in and out, is not effectively shown what the traffic will look like. I would think that if you close the parking lot, that you would have to have signage so people would see that before they come to the driveway, before they attempt to turn left or right. Otherwise, there will be a big mess and people talked about the lights. There's a continuous flow. That's true, but also you will get spurts of three, five, seven cars coming through Palms Drive and through the ferry crossing. And when they come from Palms Road, you can't make a left turn. If they happen to also come from the ferry across here, they can't make a left turn. That backs up traffic. And so you are creating, I believe, with 106 parking lots and the study that we got from Wayne, whoever they are, that that is not an effective study that has Explain to me how you can handle the traffic when you close it, when you have to close it, the signage that would be required, and if there were a red light with an arrow indicating, hey, the parking lot is closed so that the people know before they get to the driveway. I am concerned with the congestion that we may create at the driveway. Well, one thing I want to say is, you know, Joe and I aren't traffic experts, and we're not traffic engineers. Obviously, we hired Wade Trim, who's, who's well respected in, in the traffic. And, and, and they, they do their studies, and they have their engineers, and they have their policies. They do, everything's done on the peak end. Everything's done on peak traffic. Every study's looked at peak, it looked at peak hours, peak, peak, peak time used. Those guys have a system, it's, it's, it's pretty well thought out. It's explained to us as best they can. They deal with them not directly. As as a sir, sure your 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 traffic team has done in many times their own. Different I understand program. that they're experts, and as I indicated, I'm no longer versed in the art of simulation. So yes. I did that about 35 years ago. So I don't. Yeah, and, and we're not experts on, on traffic either. We, I, we hire experts. We hire them to review I look that. And, at a blocked driveway with people coming from the left and from the right to make a turn into that driveway on that traffic situation without a left turn lane and or an entranceway. I believe that that will not be sufficient to maintain good <coughs> traffic flow. And I would request that perhaps you'd ask the uh, way uh, to look at a more continuous flow rather than a discrete, discrete flow, as I presume this is when looking at the introduction to uh, uh, synchro. synchro. Why would you like to talk to the traffic consultant from who was recommended? No, by I think that that is beyond my scope. Uh, I think what you have to do is tell them that when you look at the traffic study, for example, you say 34 in, 34 out. What you need to look at is 60 in, 20 out. 20 out, 60 in. How does that impact that requirement? as they indicated, is not needed with regards to left turn and, and uh, alike. I, I, I have traveled that road, and as I said, I made the uh, entrance and exit into Sassy Marina. When that bridge was closed, that's what concerns me, when you close the parking lot. Well, I think one of the things that I think Mark brought up some time ago that he had some experience with 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 parking and whatnot when Rod brought up what's going to happen when the lots fall. This was quite a few meetings ago. He said he puts a sign out front, lot fall with an arrow, and that that was pretty much it. Is that not what was said? Um, you know, we're not going to have, you know, we're not going to allow them to come into the to the, I, no, the restaurant you and then tell them it's full and send them out. We're going to put something at the street and we'll have to man that and, and make sure that that's right. We don't want to have trouble and congestion getting in any more than Bobby Max does, who is actually a bigger restaurant than we are. We don't want to have a problem with cars coming in and out. I don't know if they're having problems with it, but according to MDOT, 
And according to the consulting list that they gave us and the person that we hired and they worked with Giffels, the numbers are what the numbers are. And I'm like you, I'm not really following the synchronicity of everything, but they're saying this is what a restaurant does. This is how many turns it does, how many left turns, right turns. And then they take into effect the actual traffic counts that were done, which way they were going. This, there's, there's less cars going this way at 5 o'clock than there are going this way. That's right. You know, so they add all that in, and that's why they get percentages of how many turns are coming left and how many turns are turning. And right. I'm coming to a wedding at 6.30 in the afternoon, and I'm the minister for that wedding, and I can't come into your parking lot. Right. What are you going to tell me? Right. Uh, I'm just asking. <laughs> that, that's my problem. As I see it, when you have to close the parking lot, and you indicate it, that you were going to put that into the contracts that you are limiting the parking to the people who want to come in there. Uh, I am still concerned that we have 223 numbers uh, coming to event area one, or 423 people coming to event number one. By the time you talk about 423 people coming to a wedding, not too many people can come to the wedding. But it's still 106 cars. I mean, you're still limited by the 106. That's why, and, and that's why you have the problem at that entrance. And when you indicate to me in the study, the study is based on existing conditions. We have no existing conditions into the driveway. So how can we? These are all guesstimates, right? The existing the conditions. Of predictions by you that's and the study of traffic. I understand. It's that. not by <laughs> us. We didn't do the study. We. You know, I know. Trim says this is what this is how they do them for all the restaurants. They count what the traffic is at their location. So even when a new restaurant's going in down the road or whatever, they count the traffic and they project what the numbers will be based on their experience. Yeah, they have a system the way they track traffic. I, I don't know it. I know. We don't know it. I, I know. They have a way that I've got approved traffic studies. I they understand that. Yeah. I'm not, you know, they approved it. So I, okay, okay. Based on the scenario that uh, Way has uh, put forth, and a worst case scenario as we discussed the traffic coming in and out, what would be your uh, countermeasures to prevent any uh, difficulties? Well, one of the things we're going to do is uh, we have the approval from MDOT with the permit is we're going to actually raise our approach slightly, giving a better perch angle both ways to see in and out. So it's going to be a little little higher up with a cap over the top of that. Um, you know, I've pulled in and out of that for over two years since we bought it, and I have not had any problems looking left. My wife's car is a, a, a shorter car. I have no problems looking left and seeing what's coming in and out of there. And I've gone all kinds of times, day and night, rush hour, non-rush hour. I've been out there all the time, okay, and so, I haven't so, had any problems. So what is your, so what is your solution? So what we're going to do is we're going to raise up the, the uh, approach slightly so we have a little higher uh, cap flat on top, mm -hmm. flat area where you can see both left and right. And what kind of indicators are you going to have that light is full we're, to control the traffic coming in and out? I think what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to uh, adopt you know, one of the things that you said in the meeting and we're going to do a lot full sign at the road. One of the things we're looking at is using our signage and having a way to put something on the signage, you know, if something happens that way, we as well as have that. someone out at the... At we the need to see that plan in writing. Okay. okay. What was that? We, 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 so we need to see his plan in writing. Marquee up there. Oh, definitely. I, I would like to see exactly what you propose uh, to alleviate any condition when you have closed the lot. And I... I heard here, and I've looked at it, whenever I drive towards New Baltimore, there's a store with fewer parking spots than you have, and they had to have a left turn lane. I am concerned that MDOT may not have, or Wade Strip may not have looked at all of the conditions appropriately between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. when you have a, a full house. The full house concerns me, uh, it's too bad that we couldn't use off-site parking, to be honest with you. Well, you know, Whitey, as Ryan spoke of, they do it on the max, you know, numbers when they do their turns, and I understand your concerns, 
you know, we want to try to, you know, take care of everything. We want to make sure it's an easy in and out. Uh, would it be nice to have a five lane road there? You know, great. Uh, you know, if, if things work out, you know, down the road, you know, and we have to take a look at other options, then we'll, we'll, we want to make sure things work well. So, I mean, what does that mean specifically? Um, you know, we're trying to problem solve and do the best we can. I, I don't want all kinds of trouble getting out. I don't want boats causing trouble for neighbors. I want to make sure things are run smooth. And these are max, max, max capacities. Most weddings aren't 400 people. Everybody's all scared about that. You know, most weddings are under 200. You know, and you know what we're looking at is, uh, you know, we have the space. It's four, four plus acres. You know, the space the is there. Space. So to say that you can only have 10 people here, or you got to make a real small. If if we do get a nice wedding, you know, great. That that enables us to make the money. So we're not one of the restaurants that's gone out of business. Okay. We want to be able to do other things that we can do, charitable things like that, events, and, and so that's why you know we need to be able to hit the capacities that are allowable, which are under the site plan ordinances amounts. That's why the restaurant says it's it's a bigger number based on what your ordinances allow per the square footage, but the parking number is lower, and that's what's on the site plan. No, I I, I understand uh, the parking and how it was configured and it has to do with the occupancy and all the other good stuff because of the number of square feet that you have there. I understand that. And I understand that you can't put a lot more parking spots there. And that's okay. I am only worried about when you close that driveway to entrances and when people try to come there and try to make left and right turns and what's going to happen at that intersection. That, that's my only concern. Well, we will, uh, you know, put together a, a plan. I hope that doesn't delay everything, but we will put together something in place which would include, you know, one of Mark's suggestions as well as a man, a man at the location, you know, in terms of on a big event, you know, if the lot's full, we're going to have somebody out there directing traffic. If, if cars leave, you know, then the sign can come up. Someone will be there making sure in terms of what's going on with parking. We don't want cars coming in and having to turn around and run out. Well, you can't. Right. I mean, we do have a new driveway by the restaurant, but we don't. We don't want to do that. No, no. So we're gonna we're gonna actively make sure we take care of that. And if you consider an automatic count and a sign that comes on and off, what? <laughs> well, that would be nice. I mean, we'd love to I, have. I don't know what it costs. I have no clue. I but think I've that's many parking lots. <laughs> All right, we're gonna on from this. I think we have the general idea of we still have concerns of parking or the entrance into or out of 129 into this facility. I'm just going to hit a couple points right now. I do have a question for clarification. It says that the destination will include a restaurant, a swim, a pool, bar, quote, pool area. Could you clarify what you're talking about? Uh, which, which question? A swim up pool bar pool area. Are you talking just so the pool or there would be a pool the pool area, the fenced in area, which is that surrounds the pool, chase lounges, and then the pool itself would actually be a swimming pool, about two thousand square feet. With a bar in it? With a bar area in it, yes. The, the, we've talked to the DEQ and they 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 do they have proven the a DQ in, in the state of Michigan manages pool, commercial pool. In some in some states it's Health, health department in in, in uh, Michigan is the DEQ. The DEQ advised us that we're able to build this bar in the location as it's as it's designed. We may we will not serve alcohol in in the bar or in the pool until that's been approved. We've got we've got uh, uh, politicians working on changing that, making adjustments for that. Right they, now, this is what you're requesting. Right now, we request the design of the pool be approved by DEQ. They've approved, they've approved the design as it sits. And instead of a bar area where it would be um, uh, serving liquor, it could be, a, could be a table area. But leave the bar as designed, as they feel optimistic that, that they can Leave the space seat. in the pool, and then you could have chairs in there, people sitting in there, it would but not serving Until there. the law would change. Second question. Hours of operation for outdoor dining and live entertainment. If you 
So get that. What I think at one point in this many pages of documents, I saw a comment from the applicants, we'll just follow the rules. What are you looking for if you have a brand of that? I didn't, I didn't catch that last part of that, I'm sorry. Hours of operation for outdoor dining and live entertainment. If you're approved to do that, I believe in many of these submittals, there's somewhere that says you're just going to follow whatever the rules are. What are you looking for if that is granted? The, the outdoor entertainment, we, we put a schedule in, I believe. The restaurant will be open bar hours, which would be Michigan liquor license, indoors. Outdoors will follow noise ordinances and, and be to 11, 11 p.m. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at that. I believe, yeah. I believe it's, 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 it's And I guess my final comment, because I could go through a lot of this, but at this particular point, we've gone, as you've mentioned, through quite a few re reviews. We still have this public hearing open. From my perspective, we still have a lot of discrepancies between all these submittals that we've been going through. I personally am finding it very difficult to follow whether it's a site plan, whether it's a last submittal from the DEQ. I would think it would make more sense, considering we have this fourth review now, we have all these concerns, some of which have been addressed when you did your PowerPoint, but us as a planning commission don't have in front of us, without trying to hodgepodge all this together, a very clear, concise picture of what we were actually asking. And that's just my important. Any other questions? Can, can I speak? Yes, absolutely. To say that I'm frustrated is putting it very mildly. When I got this, and I had to dig through 101 pages to figure out what you were trying to talk about, is ridiculous. This is your project, not ours. It's up to you to give us the information of what you want, not for us to tell you what you want. You're saying you're frustrated because we keep making you come back. This is why you keep coming back. As we noted, that was a request from the planning. Every it still doesn't answer our questions. But Christine, you know, and I apologize if you're having frustration, definitely. <coughs> I don't want to do that, okay? I was frustrating being asked to give all my transpondence with the Army Corps and going out and copying 150 pages times 15 pages. But that's what I was requested for. Who were you requested that from? From Giffels. They wanted all correspondence. It was in the scope. It was in the last. It was in the scope. Every transmission. Okay, this is going back to there seems to be a theme with this whole project that we are trying very hard as planning commission members to follow this along with. Gilfels Webster, who works for the township and is paid by the township, to analyze what they give us, analyze what you give us. But at this particular point, I don't know how anybody can possibly think we're going to follow this and not inadvertently, whether it's the numbers that don't match for the number of people, the total parking spots, or my hours of operation. It is extremely difficult, and the theme seems to be, well, Giffel said this, and Giffel said that, or then you don't understand, because the planning commission wasn't clear. So we're trying very hard to make this happen, to figure out what you're looking for, but I've got to say, this is extremely difficult to follow. So we are still in a public hearing. We have options that we've exercised to keep open the public hearing, which is now up to about a six month period. I, at this point, feel we still have outstanding difficulties. I'm looking for an answer how to get us all on the same page because I don't think we're all on the same page. I mean, the number for the pool, you've got 456 people listed. The floor plan indicates the pool area has a maximum capacity of 456. The traffic study and the site plan show a maximum capacity of 223. Which is it? That's a whole lot of people. The difference is the square footage of the area versus the parking lot. There's parking, there's a parking, there's, there's, there are two different. One is building code for the area, square foot per person, per occupant. We had, we had, we had a, a 
uh, a board member asked us to, to lay that. I believe it was Thomas. Asked the us to lay out a description of what the building code would be for those same square footages. And we also have parking constraints. So those are two different, I agree those are two different numbers and the confliction is confusing. There are two different buildings. There's a building code. Of course, we're restricted by a parking lot. But Thomas asked to have what the actual space required in one of the meetings. So that's why we put it on the sheet. And as far as the actual scope, okay, from Giffels that is has Rod's name on here and your name, Kathy, and my name on this sheet here. It says here, provide copy of transmittal and any response received from the U.S. Army Corps to the township. And that's what we did. And, and you got a copy of this through your email, and Rod, Rod approved this on July 29th. You can go ahead and respond, Rod. Please yeah. do so. Let's, let, let's read the entire bullet Thank point, you. because the bullet point says, Boat traffic projections and current site plan to be submitted to the Army Corps of Engineers for review and comment. Please provide a copy of the transmittal and the response received from and the any response. Stop. Please stop. Okay. Let me finish. So the boat traffic projections and the current site plan were to be sent to the Army Corps. Provide a transmittal so that we know that you actually did that in whatever response they received. That does not mean that you dump every single email that you have to necessarily provide when you never really provided the summary of the boat traffic. So you, you, it says right here, anticipated boat traffic assumptions of operations based on the current site plan, which includes restaurant and outdoor pool and private event area, include anticipated weekday peak hour traffic and weekend peak hour to peak day traffic. That was never provided. That, that's what we referred to earlier as information that was missing. And then we just wanted to see that you actually sent that to the Army Corps and that they responded, yes, we received it and here's our comments. That was the essence of what was being requested as part of the submittal. So it was misunderstood. We said any transmittal, we provide you all the transmittal. Okay. That's, uh, that, was the, that was a misunderstanding, but I guess our point earlier was that all this information wasn't necessarily provided, and apparently you may have misunderstood what we meant by that, but that's the clarification. But how Honestly. do we get past the miscommunication? That seems to be the theory. Since January, yeah. Since January, that seems to be permeating this particular project. Because I think on all levels we're all sure. wondering how, because we could do this for another six months. It's not the answer. Right. No. It's absolutely not the answer. It's not fair to the community. It's not fair to anybody sitting in this board and or to the applicants. We need to figure out, without doing one of the other options that we have to do, how do we get to that point where we can look at a very clear, concise answer to our questions that I don't really think have been difficult. And and, and for example, one of the things that was brought up was the floor plan. Yeah. I think the clear solution to that is that the floor plan should be amended to state exactly what the occupancy they're requesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That way there's no discrepancy. So the floor plan says it's going to be X number. That's going to match up with your traffic study. It's going to match up, match up with everything else. Everything will be the same. Um, and I think that's just a simple amendment to the floor plan to reflect those numbers. This is, these are the numbers in these different areas of the floor plan. These are the maximum capacities that we're going to permit as part of our proposal. And then I think all the numbers will align that. So there's, there's some simple things that can be done. Because otherwise, when they're, when they're not aligning, five years from now, if this project's approved and somebody comes back and says, oh, we've got a problem or a violation, someone's gonna pull one sheet out that says you can have 500 and something people, and someone else is gonna pull out another one, and there's gonna be confusion, and we don't want that. We want everybody to be treated equally and fairly and based on the same set of assumptions. And that's what we're trying to do. It's just becoming <clears throat> extremely difficult to get there. Right. So I'm looking for a solution to get us there because to do it another six months of coming back and forth is not gonna work. This just doesn't make any sense. Right. I think probably we gotta start with, we need to complete all together site plan with numbers matching from the applicant because it's your project. What do you want us to look at? What do you want us to approve? Or Kathy, request? Kathy, I, I'm sorry if there's any frustration. We're, we're very frustrated as well and I, I, I apologize. You know, we were told in a meeting by one of the board members that he wanted something on the restaurant. That's what we did. We can change it back, but that's what we were told. So we ran and did it. 
I you think know, the problem, though, is becoming you're, you're, you're taking one thing and then everything else kind of falls apart. And I don't know how much clearer in writing what Rod just read, one prime example of the boat study and all that. Somehow we end up with this huge packet of emails. That's what I'm trying to avoid, because I cannot imagine from an applicant's point of view, you guys must be super frustrated. I get that, and that's not what we're trying to do. So we need to figure out how to get past this point. Yeah. So we, we, can change, we can change the number back off of that number, which shows what the square footage would actually allow to what the actual parking number allows, which is what we originally had. That's an easy fix. Um, as far as the emails, you know, I'm sorry. it took. A lot of time for me to do all that, and when I read any response, that's what it told me to do. My bad. Uh, you know, we did contact uh, email to find out about the extra copies. Do I need to make a 12-page copy times 15, or we just made a small change on the curb? Can we just change those three sheets? The email was sent back to us saying that it is preferred to have a full set. And then later said, and I have a copy of the email here, it was later said to do it. So that's what we did. Now, if you want me to run up, you know, I'll, I'll run out and make 15 copies of the new page with the new number on it, and then that Actually, should be... Let me, let me stop you there. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I see we're going in the wrong direction again. And I'm just going to talk out loud, and I'm looking for input from the planners at this particular point, because... You have to also follow the rules and procedures that are in place. Everything needs to go to the building department, who then disperses it in the order that it's set up under our rules. And that's how it has to happen. You can't just submit them directly to the plan. I'm just saying anything from, I think that we've been very, very clear about that. So with that in mind, how do we get <coughs> To a clean package, Rod or whoever from the planners, how do you, and I'm almost going to say at this particular point, I believe we need to have this somehow in a black and white format because he said this or she said that or in the email. Emails can be very deceiving, I guess, at times, so I'll give you that. So, how do we get to that point? I'm open to suggestions. Question. Can if only one or two sheets change, can there be a nice old stamp that says this replaces sheet A, B, C, D, E of such and such a date, throw it out and put that in there? I don't know. Is that acceptable? I find that dangerous. No. I think that's difficult at this point. Uh, well, yeah, no, at this point, but is that in general acceptable to do? Generally, people, when you're dealing with the plan commission and the packets, generally there's a complete submittal. And Every most, time. I would say in most instances, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I think the thing that I would try to do is focus on information that you want to see that you haven't seen or something that needs to be adjusted. And so maybe we can tick through as many of those. Um, one possibility, if you do you want to go through that now, or do you want to try to see if we can work between maybe the chair and the applicant and us trying to come up with a list of all of the information that needs to be there and issues that need to be resolved, and then try to come to an, an agreement so everybody's on the same page? That's the one suggestion of a way we might approach it, so that they are hopefully clear and we're clear on what's expected. That's one approach. One, one other would be to sit here and try to go through it right now. And go one item. Probably item not, because we've also item. received a lot more input from the public. Again, maybe a couple right. of topics that we maybe did not think about. Right. But I'm also concerned if there's a way to facilitate the rest of the members of this board, because you and I and the applicant, I can miss something. I mean, I've taken notes. I'm trying Come to. On. Is there a leak? Um, legal way to have them without having another meeting so we don't keep delaying this process, have the board members submit their questions that maybe aren't contained. Um, um, open meetings. You can, um, 
you can submit questions through the building department okay. that would then be available for anyone to see. Perfect. Okay. They should not be done by emails between. No. Each no, other. no. 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 Um, you could su submit informational requests that you think are appropriate based on the zoning ordinance requirements. Send that through to the Cindy. building department through Cindy. And then she could provide that and then that could be part of what everybody reviews when we get together and discuss this with the applicant, whether it's by phone, email, meeting, or what have you, to get that list together so everybody's on the same page in terms of what they need to do. So um, maybe we give everybody a week to provide those questions or what five days whatever you think is reasonable they can submit those through to the building department so that that's all available for anyone to see then that the new list would be put together whatever that request is that would also be available for public inspection because that's what we're doing we're in the, uh, the open oh absolutely everything needs to be out in the open and then uh, then the applicant would prepare that New, new um, submittal with all that information, and hopefully that will resolve your informational requirements. What is the board thing? If it is one week, would that when would the next meeting be on those points then? Because normally well, we have a week. You'd have then to then resubmit. So um, it would likely be your December, December meeting, December. which December is early, which is earlier meeting. than normal. December eleventh. Right. It's December eleventh. December 11th. So when would that be due, my portion then? We haven't quite got there yet, just told us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fine. November 20th. November 20th would be the submittal deadline. And submittals all need to go through, again, the building department for the proper Correct. procedures. Correct. So, a week from today. So October 30th. So October 30th, we, we have all the questions, and then we allow for another five or five to seven days to, to agree on exactly all the missing information. And, um, get, then they still have time to prepare that and submit by November 20th. So I think we're still. I think we're good. We so 10:30 would be any board members who have additional questions. Yeah, questions. Or, Submitted to Cindy in the building department. That would be 10 by 10 30 at the close of business. Mm -hmm. Then, what's your proposal? Then we would we would review that and then try to agree on what we think is the list that could then be provided to the applicant. And then if they had questions, then they would get back in touch with us and make sure everybody's on the same page and then they can proceed with preparing a response. And where in that would you propose if we do this? Someone from the planning commission, you and the applicant, maybe have a face-to-face -face in the same room? If it's necessary, yes. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if maybe that's, maybe that's, I have. No I'd like to do that, that if we could. Sure. <clears throat> so the for sure date we have right now, board members need to get whatever you want to end by December 30th. Is somebody going to review it so we don't took the case okay before it goes out? Is that going to be the I'm sure I'm not sure I understand. Well five of us have yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She'll she'll narrow it. If there's duplicate questions, she's not going to okay. we'll, we'll, so we got that part of it. Bill Folsom Webster will review that they made a powerpoint presentation tonight do you have that I do not you need to provide that oh, we, so they downloaded it oh we have so we have so we have okay so, so we have we have yeah. yes. it's on your laptop so because that did entail answering yeah that's helpful we'll look at that okay so we have can we look at that I think you're that's you're officially providing that correct yeah yes okay. yes and we can we can um now that we have it we can email it to you Perfect. So, okay with that? Okay with that. Um, and there's the new DEQ yeah, stuff that came in there. Right. None of us have saw. Yeah, I really looked at it. No, we don't have that. Right. <laughs> I just kind of looked through it. I see a bunch of stuff next to I don't think we've seen that. Yeah, I just we just got an email late this afternoon, so we certainly got a lot of stuff there. You got a letter from DEQ? 
that um, your permit and whatever was part of your application. There was a bunch of material. There. <coughs> I thought we had Cindy has it now. It's all been it's all been emailed to Cindy. It, it came in it's late late this afternoon. I think five o'clock or five thirty or something. Oh, Smith, I thought. It's probably all stuff you've so seen. It's, it's all yeah. stack. I it's thought we all stack. So <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. So we you think of me a, a com complete submittal? No, we do. We want to see licenses all over again. You want to see everything all over again? Yeah. I, I think they're looking to see the whole package. I mean, you want to see the DEQ license <coughs> reprinted. The we're going to talk about, like, for example, all those emails. Okay. We're going to we'll talk, talk about how we yeah. can consolidate that good. so we can do something. We're not trying to. Yeah, we're, we're not trying to make you du duplicate a bunch of paper that's unnecessary. We're yeah, that's sure we what need. we provide is what you need. That's, well, we'll meet. Good. We'll meet on. We'll meet on. Whatever Sometime day after the 30th. Within Sometime after, after the 30th. After that. And we'll figure that out. So and how should I contact through Matt then? Um, contact through, probably through Send. Well, we can, um, it'll be set up. You, yeah, you can email us and keep Kathy, after the 30th. Kathy, Kathy Cindy, and, and Matt, and myself all in the loop. That way we're all. Because okay. I, I personally think it would make more sense to put us all in the same room at this point. I think so too. Okay. Okay. Just to clarify, 1030, board members has questions. And what day do you think you'll have the consolidated? There'll be a meeting sometime after that? Is that what yeah, we have to obviously check our schedules and figure that out. But we're hoping sometime within a week after that to be able to We've got about the next step. So that'll make 1030, that'll make till November 7th, and then we have till the 20th to submit our answers. Yeah, so that'll give you almost two weeks to pull your stuff together. Okay, the 6th is okay. That's, that's yeah. after. Yeah. We're happy with that. As long as we... That's, that's it. Three days. Actually. I know Tom. Right. I'm not going to open it up. No, I just want to ask a question. It, it sounds to me like there's going to be a closed meeting that's not open to the public going on. No, it's not closed. No. Sounds like it. No, no. no. And the not, we are meeting. not trying to hide anything from anybody. We want to have it all out there, and we very much value everybody's input, whether it's the community, whether it's the planners. We just need to, if you haven't noticed, this project, I'm going to keep using the word theme, we have to get past that, and we're not going to, if we don't do something more assistant, I guess, organized. I'm not sure what the correct terminology is. That's why I'm asking for the input from Rod and everybody else who's sitting here. So, but no, it is going to be above board. Everything's going to be out there for the public to see. It's and you're posting the questions. Mm -hmm. And you're posting the questions. Oh yeah. So that's not that's not private. Be fine. Okay. So with that. No. We're gonna, we're gonna have to do another motion to post the form. That's what the so should we wait for Tom to come back? I'm sorry, he left. Hold on a second. We've been going at this for a while. Uh, that would be the site plan. Okay. We're waiting for you to come back. <laughs> we need to do a vote. The figures, right? Wait until you get a vote. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're saying? Are you ready? The date of the meeting, site plan consideration. Let's get the right sheet here. And this is a. Um, that's a new site. Okay. So we need to make a motion. Move to continue the uh, site plan public hearing for the special rule of land use uh, at 7317 Dyke Road until. It should be to, to the like December meeting if that's if that's what you're, you're keeping the public hearing open. So you should December twelfth or December eleventh, excuse me. December
Edward Keller, excused. Brady Simon, yes. Christine Holcomb, yes. Harold Payne, Mark Borchardt, yes. Tom Cozell, yes. Robert Grizzly, yeah. he's absent. Absent. Excused. And Kathy Schweiker, yes. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. At this particular point, if anyone chooses to leave, because the board still has another five or six items to continue with. I would just ask you to ask it now quietly, and then we'll continue on with our um, agenda items, okay? Thank you for attending. Thank you. Keith, come back here. Keith, get Keith back here. Keith, he's in my seat. So, yes. <laughs> it is moving me again. No, not your side. Still at the table. Still at the table. Please come down. Community planning month, so we would like to take a picture. We're taking pictures of the plant, all the planning commissions as part of, part of that celebration because of all the great things you do. And we have a, a little, a brief little uh, overview of what we're going to do about a um, guest we brought with us as part of community planning month. So, is that what we do? Huh? Is that what we're doing? Right you're doing. You're going to be doing it it's in just a few minutes. When really? You're, when you're What's your date <laughs> tonight, <boy? laughs> and, 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 a, and a reminder. That on, let me get my date right. You set the uh, master plan open house for November 13th, which is also the day of the meeting in November. But you're doing on the island? Island first. So that's going to be yes, yeah. at um, 3 o'clock. We think it's going to be, uh, we're still finalizing times. We think that'll be 3 to 4.30 on the island. And the then 5 and 5.30 to 7 here. And then your meeting will be after that open house. 5.30 to 6. 45. <laughs> and, and planning commission. Have you called well. anybody at the Lions Hall to make sure? Yeah, that's all been. Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, mainland. November 13th. Oh, Wednesday. Um, we, that was originally. We, we got that tonight, though, that we weren't sure if you would have to have a meeting that night. So now that you're at the meeting, we may have to proceed to the same time. So we'll, we'll finalize that. Okay. If you can. You already got notices out. All right. If you guys don't have a problem with starting your meeting a little bit later, starting 30 that night only. Hmm. 
Yeah. Send us an email. Send us an email for Delvin Ray. No, but I think we may need to uh, make sure we post that too. That, that would have to be posted yeah. at a different time. Yeah, and that, at least 18 hours in advance. Yes, and that will that will be done. And then the other thing I want you to be aware of, if you don't already know about it, is that on Monday, it's coming Monday. Turkey sandwich. Yeah, you can get, you can, <laughs> Eleven you can get a free, uh, free sandwich. I don't know if it's free or not. But St. Clair County um, Metropolitan Planning Workshop. Good old spark. Hmm? Good old spark. Right? Good old spark. I hope a lot of you will come there. Um, I will be there. When is it? Matt will be there. Monday. Monday. We're going to be talking all about site planning. So. Can we call? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm scheduled. Good. Good. I was supposed to be. I, I'm getting the turkey sandwich. Here, <laughs> 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 I see Cindy is in the back. <laughs> 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 Cindy, do you have a Can you come forward for just a second? Yeah, no. Are you driving? Yeah. How about your show for She's driving you. As far as November 13th, yeah. We're, because of the timing with the open houses, we I've like it. have to start this half hour. I already sent an email. You're so fast. Thank you. I That's how I remember I just sent an email. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Are you done? So, 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 so yeah. So that we're going to start the Harsons Island at three. We're going to start the one on the main one. At Six and then your meeting is going to be at seven. And if any of us can attend, we will. But mm -hmm. um, please do. We would like to see as many planning commissioners at these open houses as possible. So on the island. On both. Oh. You did it during the day, so it's a long day. <laughs> well, whoever well, can be there at three or five. That would be very helpful yeah. just to have as many. Good so yeah. show yeah. force is always great. Will you yeah. send out an email yeah. reminder? Yes. Thank you. We're going to have a public notice too, right? Yes. yes. For those meetings. Oh, sure. To put in the paper. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Can I move on to item number nine? Would be video. Item number nine: ZBA representatives report. There was one appeal. Uh, I believe the address was 6403 Dyke Road. It was a reappeal. If you remember, back in November, or, I'm sorry, back in June. We had a gentleman that requested a variance to build a boathouse uh, on a non-conforming lot. There was no uh, no house on the lot. He reappealed. He has uh, documentation from the DEQ to allow a larger well. And of course, they've approved the boathouse, not knowing what our ordinances were. And it was denied again based on the non-conformity of the lot. So that's in the fire report. Thank you. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Item number 10, board representatives report. Well, the only thing I had was the uh, master plan open house on November 13th from 3 to 4 30. <laughs> <laughs> that was about it. No need to discuss. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> that was a big one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, bring everything I can to the table. Okay. Chairperson's report is number 11. I really don't have anything to add other than there are three planning commission members who should have received a letter or I got my termination notice. <laughs> well, it's not exactly a termination notice. You can reapply. You can reapply. So. I had my package yeah, notice for Robert. Robert. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll get that to you. You don't know who you are. <laughs> <Do you? laughs> we got that as a wrong package. Maybe you can get that back to Cindy right. so she can get that to where it goes. Sorry about that. But there's, I think it's Robert, Christine, and who was the other one? <laughs> Keith. Oh, that's right. Welcome back, Keith. So you know what you need to do to take care of that if you... Yes, you do. <laughs> so. Just ignore it? No. Call Artie. Artie was here. You talked to him. Okay. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Number 12, Planning Commission Member of Comments. I, I got a question. Um, Rod, you know, where this, uh, uh, where this location, where this is going, it's really close to Iron. We're talking all these traffic studies and all this and that and the other thing. Has anybody looked at Ira Township's zone and what's near that area? Um, it's close to the border. Mm -hmm. It is. Close. It is. Um, we're generally familiar with it. We have all of our information. Um, if you want us to share all that, we can. I just, you know, myself, I just looked at it and, you know, that's right above. Dyer Drive, just north. It's, mm -hmm. 
it's all right there. commercial. It's commercial all through this whole area, pretty thick. Mm -hmm. I know it's Iowa. Sure. You know, but oh, yeah. Maybe it's one of those questions. That's contributing to the whole thing. Maybe yeah. that's one of those questions you can submit by October 30th. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Through the proper channels, correct? <laughs> the Iowa Township Planner is in our yeah. office, so we can there you go. take quite a lot. I got a question. Yeah. I don't know. How can they make the Dollar General put a, a left-hand turn lane, which doesn't even come close to the business that this guy is projecting at 200 cars or, or at a wedding? And how did MDOT pass that? I mean, they made them put the left-hand turn lane in there. Yeah, yes, they were. Yeah. Yeah. It, was it, it wasn't part of the zoning that we had. Yeah, that was part of the site plan review. Happen. I, 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 I don't know what MDOT's um, information was for that, so I can't tell you. I don't know what they reviewed. Do you know whether this is a discrete study simulation or just a static? The way the synchro model works is you input the peak hour traffic by direction, by turn movement. You um, put in the information about the dimensions of the number of lanes and you put in assumptions about the way traffic platoons and arrives and it will calculate um, forecast of delay and levels of service um, and that's the way traffic most studies are used Syn synchro um, as part of the capacity analysis and that can in fact do a simulation which is sim traffic which actually animates and shows how that how that all operates. So, so it is a continuous simulation of the traffic. If it's built as the model, yes, it will do that. And you can actually build a network. Do we know whether they use that model to that extent? I know they well, they use the software to calculate the delay, yes. So I know they use that's what they use. They said, it's what they, they said they use. But based on the information and the traffic flow in and out of the site that was projected. Right, they actually counted in front of the site and then projected their own traffic on top. So they did new counts in front of the site in August, in August for the rest of yeah, the Did they the consider Rose Marine's traffic coming in out of that building? Uh, yes, they did. Because they had really? a, they, the way they did the count was they man mounted a camera above I saw that. that. And that's where the counts came from. So they were able to pick up. Um, pedestrian movements and all that, they had everything. Well, well that Rose Marine uh, building right there is uh, no longer public. It's uh, strictly employees. Mm -hmm. right. So there's not a lot of traffic moving yeah. out there anymore. Right. Okay. Any more comments for the Planning Commission members? Hearing none, we're going to go to item number 13, public comments. Anybody who wants to make a public comment, you know the routine. <laughs> You're familiar, you know how it works. <laughs> Diane Miller, 7311B Lane, and I won't bring up anything about the public hearing. Um, Thank you. The, um, the master plan, um, you said that that's going to be an open house meeting, and will that be recorded? Of course. I don't think no, so. Not. No. not open house. Because it's, not, it's, not, it's not, not like a meeting like this, no. it's an open house or stations. For people to come and get information. Maybe the board meeting should be connected to that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an open house to discuss. The it's an open house. So is it something so like for on. more information pertaining to the survey? It is a way for, for the planning commission to get additional input from the public in terms of how they feel about the master plan, long range planning, and land use related issues in the township. Okay. Thank you. It's primarily a listening session. We're here to listen to the public. Okay, great. Um, the other thing is the videotapes of the planning meetings. Um, I'm not sure what's going on. They are not being posted as timely as the board meetings are. The township board meetings are usually posted within, you know, a day, two days maximum after they're recorded. The planning commission meetings have been taken five to ten days sometimes before they're posted and available to us. I don't know who's responsible for posting the videos after. Um, I know Michael does them when he's here recording, 
but when they're recorded from the back, it seems like when Michael's not here doing it and they're recorded from back there, they're not being posted in a timely manner. And I don't know who's responsible. I know it's new to have the, the planning and the zoning meetings um, recorded. I but don't have an answer for that because that's not something I know. I know they're being recording. I know they're supposed to be posted. I don't know what the turnaround time frame is. So um, you, the planning board isn't responsible for posting the meetings? And, and we don't know who is? Township. Township. Probably the supervisor. So Actually, can I ask a question only because you two are standing back there? Do you have an answer to that question? I think the difference is that when our board meetings are being recorded, as soon as the board meeting is over, RD is here, and he'll go back and he'll start uploading that. Um, so a lot of times when you guys meet on Wednesdays, on Thursdays he's uploading it. We're not open Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so if he doesn't get that completed and get back to it on Thursday, sometimes it won't be posted until the following Monday. But I can certainly mention it to him. Sometimes it's been even longer than that, but yeah, I appreciate it if it could be a little bit more consistent and regular to be, to be uploaded. But the answer is already the one who does. Yes. Okay, get your answer okay. that. Everybody told me that Artie didn't have anything to do with the planning commission. <laughs> Artie can't have yeah. his hands on anything to do with the planning commission. You know, he that's doesn't decide what posting means. He's already got a video poster. Okay, that's true. But not the last time. Okay, and one other thing. When Michael is here, Mr. Zorin, we can always hear all of you guys. After the public hearing was over and you guys had that conversation, if it was being recorded from the back, we wouldn't have been able to hear these guys at all. If they don't come up to the microphone, we can't hear them on the videos. I'd like to ask you to please, I know I've asked before, to be more diligent on using the microphone for when I can't always be here for meetings. And there's a lot of people that do watch them from home. I've been watching. There's been 150 to 200 people watching these planning commission meetings on a pretty regular basis. But it's really difficult to hear with the microphones when they're recorded by the back. When Mr. Zorin records them, they're, they're, they're clear. You can, you can hear them even if you don't step up to the microphone. So I don't know whether it's old equipment back there or what, but anyway, that's all I have. We'll try to be more conscientious of that. I'm sorry. I appreciate it. It's just that when you're not, you know, when you're not able to be here and you're trying to listen from home, you're only getting half of the conversation. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you get some more time off. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else from the audience who wishes to make a public comment? <coughs> One last call. Not seen any hands? Go ahead, Wendy. So moved. <laughs> Second. No. We uh, pay for uh, no, we do not. All of you are in the